Council is please stand. Almighty God, we the representatives of the citizens of the City of Brisbane are assembled here to strive and care for the welfare of our city and all its people. Lord, we ask that you guide us in the decisions we make today. Amen. We acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we meet and pay our respect to Elders past and present. Please be seated. I declare the meeting open and welcome you all back to the Council Chamber uh, for the first meeting in person of this term. Um, and I'd like to thank everybody for their patience. Uh, in particular, I'd like to thank the many staff members who worked uh, extensively to be able to put this back together and to also acknowledge the work of the council officers who have upgraded the microphone system. I, tr I trust that most councillors have been made aware of the new microphone and the new video system uh, and that it... Um, I trust that you've all been advised that your, your microphones will now have timers on them. Uh, please be considerate that uh, for this meeting, you will be able to see your time, but I will not be able to see the time. My computer that shows that has yet to arrive, so please be um, courteous about that. Um, now, also, I'd like to remind councillors that when a point of order is made against you or against the order at that time, uh, it is incumbent upon you to turn off your microphone to preserve your time because we will be relying on the time shown. Uh, councillors, I also understand, hopefully it's been explained to you, the hot mic system, that councillors who don't have their own microphone will be sharing two speaking positions. Uh, they will... Uh, they will be able to use their smart cards to ensure that they're uh, shown correctly on the screen. And also I'd like to acknowledge uh, that Mr Piers will be cleaning those speaking points after each person has spoken from those points to ensure that we maintain the cleanliness of this place. So I'd like to thank him in advance. All right. Councillors, are there any apologies? There, be, there being no apologies. Councillors, uh, confirmation of minutes, please. Councillor Hutton. Mr Chair, I move that the minutes of the 4,625th meeting held on Tuesday the 11th of August 2020 be received, taken as read and confirmed. Seconded. It's been moved by Councillor Hutton, seconded by Councillor Adams that the minutes of the 4,625th meeting of Council held on the 11th of August 2020 be received, taken as read and confirmed. All those in favour say aye. Aye. To the contrary, no. no. The ayes have it. Councillors, I draw to your attention the agenda item of public participation. I'd like to call on Mr Mike Murray, who will address us on enforcement of planning and building laws. Mr Murray. Mr Murray, welcome. Thank you have five minutes. Please proceed. Thank you, Mr Chair. Councillors, I represent the Unit Owners Association of Queensland, a non-profit organisation established in 1978 to represent the property interests of more than one million Queenslanders. Councillors, we have a serious problem. Airbnb and other digital platforms recently entered our domestic space, causing many to complain of uninvited neighbours, offensive conduct and non-observance of rules in residential apartments. We established short-term accommodation was an unlawful use as it contravened development approvals, classification and fire certificates. No better evidence is Spice Apartments, where an agent, in contravention of the DA, classification and bylaws, operates a hotel against the developer's approved and intended use for residential dwelling. However, Council offends its own DA via its wholly owned subsidiary, Brisbane Marketing, by promoting Spice Apartments as an overnight hotel. How dare you secretly sell the residential amenity we purchased? Councillors, who among you would accept 100 uninvited strangers into your home to your, share your private facilities for a 14-day quarantine or a Bucks party weekend? No one? Then please do not expect unit owners to do so either. Just like your homes, our homes are not hotels either. Insurances carry wording, you must take all reasonable care to comply with any law or regulation of any government or local government body. With failure invoking, 
we will not be liable for loss, destruction, damage, liability, accidental injury or illness caused, corona perhaps. In short, failure to comply with this law renders strata insurance in a catastrophe like Grenfell, Childers, COVID cluster, totally void. These planning and building acts contain executive liability provisions that expose your officers to $1.2 million penalties via planning sections 164 and 165 for failing to act. What is the salary of executive officers so exposed and are they even aware? Councillors, in 2017, we sought clarity from Chair of Plant City Planning, Councillor Simmons, who wrote, I can confirm a development application is required for short-term accommodation proposals. Nothing has changed since Councillor Simmons provided this clarity, apart from the Chair of City Planning, now Councillor Adams, who confirmed in the Chamber on August 4, stating, we know Airbnb remains an unlawful use in this city, but went on later to, to wrongly state it does not require a development approval if it is in a centre or mixed use zone. Contradicting Councillor Adams, our preeminent town planning lawyer, Mr David Nichols, wrote, as also tabled August 4, and I quote, short term accommodation cannot be established without changing the development approval. However, it appears the council believes the change to the planning scheme that made short-term accommodation accepted or self-assessable development overrides the DA. It doesn't, end quote. The Mayor's letter invited us to take the matter to the Planning and Environment Court, a very safe response against our organisation. Unit owners call on the council to take the matter to court because that is council's responsibility to bring proper certainty to the matter. Councillors, how much more evidence must we provide to cause council to do its job? Carry out enforcement responsibilities, protect building insurance, secure health and safety, and importantly, protect the residential amenity your constituents purchased and are legally entitled to peacefully enjoy. Our units require no on-site management or manifest of occupancy for fire attendants. Which apartments contain transients? Potentially sedated, drunk, disabled, or simply unfamiliar with exits? Who and where is the fire warden? Council acknowledgement that Airbnb remains an unlawful use voids insurance. A coronal inquest, perhaps, finds council were notified but failed to act to mitigate the known risk. Negligent council officers face industrial manslaughter charges and million dollar fines. Grandfell sounds familiar. Councillor Adams, 25 approvals for short term accommodation last year, concealing perhaps 25,000 unapproved and unlawful due to failure to enforce. It is now on the public record that Council are aware of these systemic avoidable but serious risks. Council have statutory powers to mitigate risk to health and safety of occupants. Council hold a duty of care to exercise that power and to enforce the law. Our homes are not hotels. How many tourism dollars are our lives worth? Thank, thank you for this opportunity Thank you, to speak. Mr Murray. We your, your time questions. has expired. Um, if I could invite you to take a seat, please, and can I invite the Deputy Mayor to respond? Thank you, Mr Chair, and thank you, Mr Murray, for coming in. I'm sorry because of the situation. I usually can speak to you a little easier than across the heads in chambers, and I do need to speak through to the Chair as well. Look, we hear loud and, and uh, clearly the concerns of yourself and local residents when it comes to short-term accommodation in existing residential buildings. Um, having said that, under the Brisbane City Plan and with the endorsement of the Planning Act, our overarching legislation, they are a lawful style of accommodation within Brisbane. Uh, I understand that you've gotten several letters from the Lord Mayor and planning chairs over the time with regards to this. And I just wanted to outline our position here today that is consistent with those and reiterate and maybe refer to some of your other uh, comments around Council and Spice's apartments in particular as well. Um, as you're aware, the Queensland Government introduced private certifi certification for building approvals in 98, and they changed the legislation around local governments not being solely responsible for the approval of building work and actual construction of a building. 
So that means there is accepted development that does not require a development approval under the a Planning Act 2016. And that is in some of the cases for short-term accommodation as proposed. So if short-term accommodation is in a principal centre, a major centre, a district centre or a neighbourhood centre zone, and it ticks the boxes, it is self-accessible development. There's, so there's many of those that we don't see in council when you're talking about the many Airbnbs or short-term accommodations across Brisbane. Many of those are private, private certifier approved use and we don't see a lot of those. In other circumstances, it does require a council approval, but before we can even consider the approval, we do need to work through with the body corporate as the um, owner who gives consent um, for the whole uh, unit owners in the building as well. And under the body corporate powers of 1997, it is up to body corporate and community management to make and enforce its own bylaws to restrict or allow the use of short-term accommodation in a building. So um, I, th I think you realise too that it's a incumbent upon unit owners, if they do not want building to cater for short-term accommodation, they need to make sure that their body corporate is aware of that. Um, without the body corporate saying no, it's very difficult for us to be able to refuse any short-term accommodation applications as they comply as well. Uh, but with regards to the uh, one at the Spice Apartments, which you mentioned today, under the Planning Act 2016, um, short-term accommodation is allowed in this area where Spice Apartments are. Uh, it only triggers a DA from Council due to flood overlay. So Council did receive a complaint regarding short-term accommodation at Spice Apartments in South Brisbane earlier this year, 15th of April to be precise, and Built Environment did actually commence an investigation into that alleged use. Council spoke with the complainant who advised around five to eight units were being used for short-term accommodation. On the 29th of April, the officer spoke with the property manager regarding the issues and they will need to amend the DA if the, promise, the premises are being used as a short-term accommodation. So early engagement has been had. They were given a compliance date of the 28th of July and we have received notification from a town planning company that they are preparing to submit a DA to Council. So we got a further complaint on the 8th of August and Built Environment will be going out again to talk to them. So with regards to the Section 257 of the Building Act, when you talk about the liability of executive officers, um, the Planning Act created offence provisions for executive officers in circumstances where a corporation like council commits an offence against specific provisions of the respective acts and the officers did not take all reasonable steps to ensure council Council did not engage in the conduct constituting, constituting the offence. For Council to be liable, we would have to have done something or omitted to do something with the intention of enabling or aiding the principal offender to commit the offence. As I've clearly said, we have been out on site, we have spoken with the building and we understand that they are putting in a DA. The argument that Council's failure to enforce the Building Act or the Planning Act is not an offence and would be very insufficient because we are going through the process with this one in particular as well. Well. In saying that, there is a lot out there, but we need to know about them. We're not mind readers. We don't have the capabilities to be out in every residential block, but we encourage people to let us know if there is concern. We know that there is angst, but this is the disruption that we are experiencing nowadays. Uber's replacing taxis, Deliveroo replacing takeaways and pickups, emails replacing letters, probably the first disruption we saw, and Airbnbs that are ending up in residential and taking away short term accommodation opportunities for motels and hotels as well. I think what we need to see here is a uniform approach led by the state government to address this because it is a statewide, when it comes to a Planning Act matter, to get an, an agreed consensus on the way forward. There are 77 local councillors and I can assure you most of them along the uh, seaboard of Queensland are experiencing the same issue and we really do need to see a uniform approach to that. We will take action when it's raised to our attention and we intend to do that whenever it's raised to our attention and uh, I'm happy to speak again to you offline um, more about Spice's apartment and the process that's going through as well. So thank you for coming in today. Thank you, thank you Mr Murray. Thank you for your time. Mr Pearce will assist you. Councillors, I will now begin question time. Are there any questions of the Lord Mayor or a chair of any of the standing committees? Councillor Adaman.
My question is to the Lord Mayor. Lord Mayor, public consultation for the Victorian Park project has now closed, with council officers now collating feedback for Brisbane's biggest park in 50 years. Can you please give us an update on the initial feedback and the next steps for undertaking this city-shaping project? The Lord Mayor. Thank you, Mr Chair, and also thank you, Councillor Adaman, for the question. Uh, everyone remembers uh, on the first day that I became Lord Mayor, uh, I made two commitments to the people of Brisbane. Uh, the first was that I would embark on a program of a $550 million investment in new green bridges uh, across Brisbane on the Br Brisbane River, transforming the way that people move around, creating a more livable and healthy and active city and providing more sustainable alternatives to get around our city. The second commitment I made on day one was to embark on a record investment in parkland and green space. And that's happening right across the city. 110 different park upgrades happening this year alone. Uh, but the biggest and most exciting uh, and one of a citywide scale, and in fact, uh, one that has taken the attention of the nation, uh, is the Victoria Park transformation. Uh, it was interesting to see the other day, Clover Moore, uh, the Lord Mayor of Sydney said, I've got a great idea. I'm going to transform part of a golf course into a local park in Sydney. Um, great idea, Clover. Uh, this is something that I'm proud, uh, on behalf of this administration, to be championing, uh, to be funding and to be moving ahead with. Uh, our initial round of consultation attracted incredible interest and support, uh, and we've then gone into a more detailed process, uh, and I'm pleased to announce that more than 2,000, or around 2,000 people and organisations provided feedback in that second round of consultation. Now, councillors will recall that it was due to close earlier, um, but due to COVID um, and the fact that people had other things on their mind, uh, we extended that consultation period, uh, and, we, and that closed at the end of July. Uh, I want to commend and thank Councillor uh, Fiona Cunningham for the work that her and her team has done in bringing all of this together. Uh, but there are some very exciting things to come out of that consultation. Now, we see nearly 90 per cent of all of the feedback received supports the Victoria Park vision and the transformation of that space uh, into a new parkland for our city. Uh, some of the, the very exciting features that residents listed as their favourite uh, includes the creation of a new lake uh, or lagoon system, Lake Barambar. Uh, and so we know that uh, water features and lakes and lagoons are something that are much loved by the community. And bringing back a water feature into Victoria Park, there was previously water courses and water corridors through there, um, is a fantastic and much supported idea from the community. But also, they were keen to protect and enhance the existing natural areas. Uh, and so, not just a place for um, lots of open grassland, but a lot of uh, revegetation, native uh, planting to occur there. Uh, and our plan is all about planting more into Victoria Park um, so that we uh, enhance that for future generations and also for our native birds and wildlife as well. Uh, people uh, supported the opportunity for local uh, adventure and play uh, they were keen to see great public transport access into that park. That was a big factor for people. And I can confirm there will be two Brisbane metro stations and a brand new Cross River Rail station at the exhibition to provide some of the highest level of transport accessibility of any park across the city. Uh, they also supported uh, the creation of uh, a whole range or a whole network of pedestrian and cycle paths through the Victoria Park precinct. Uh, so this is the summary at this stage of what we have received from the community. We also uh, noticed that there was another theme coming through uh, when we put out the original draft concept plan. Uh, we always said this would be a park for everyone. There would be something for everyone in Victoria Park, but there was uh, a theme running through a lot of the consultation that uh, maybe we're trying to do too much uh, in one go in this park, uh, and it should be rolled out in stages progressively. Uh, to make sure that people have the opportunity to adapt to the park. Uh, so we've invested or committed $83 million over the next four years to, to start that process. Now that doesn't mean everything will be done on day one or in the next even three or four years, uh, but $83 million will be a significant investment in getting this vision uh, off the ground and providing a great space for people to enjoy. And that process will start in the middle of next year 
uh, with the golf course uh, ceasing its 18-hole golf course operation and the beginning of the transformation into a new parkland area. And that will happen uh, as we finesse and finalise the draft plan into a final plan. Uh, and we will do that uh, based on the feedback we've received. But I think this is an exciting project, an incredibly exciting opportunity for our city. Lord Mayor, your once time in a generation. Expired. Further questions? Councillor Cassidy. Are we on? Thanks very much, yep. Chair. Yep. Thank you. Thanks, Chair. Uh, my question uh, is to the Lord Mayor, Chair. Uh, Lord Mayor, I personally know of people that have sustained serious injuries and in one case died after tripping over a damaged and dangerous footpath in our suburbs. That fatal incident happened uh, to an elderly woman in Sandgate. The day after that tragedy, the footpath was ripped up and fully replaced. You claim that your administration repairs footpaths, a very loose term, Lord Mayor. Those repairs are usually a bit of bitumen poured over the cracks or grinding bits of cement away. They are rarely, if ever, full replacements of dangerous footpaths. Lord Mayor, in the spirit of Queensland Walks Week, why won't you fast track the replacement of dangerous footpaths as a COVID stimulus? Lord Mayor. Mr Chair, uh, Councillor Cassidy's question is really timely this week because one of the submissions that's coming through is the provision of funding to each and every councillor across the city of a funding boost to allow them to do exactly what oh, Councillor Cassidy talks about right the councillors, now. Councillors, councillors, to please allow, allow them to do exactly that. Because we've seen again and again, consistently, Labor councillors trying to mislead the public about the true situation with footpaths. We know the history, we know the reality, which is when they were in charge, uh, there was an appalling standard of footpaths in this city. Appalling standard. And uh, we have brought that up and increased the standard every year. And we will continue to do that with record investment and funding. Now, what Councillor Cassidy uh, loves to confuse people with is the difference no, no. between a... Councillors, please allow the Lord Mayor to be heard in silence. Now, Councillor Cassidy, please... Councillor Cassidy, I'm speaking. Please don't speak over me. Please allow the Lord Mayor to be heard in silence. The Lord Mayor. Is the difference between a, a temporary make-safe and a permanent repair. And so uh, he will continue to go and try and mislead uh, the public of Brisbane, suggesting that a temporary repair is somehow a substitute for a permanent repair, when we know it is just one step in the process that we take. And guess what? The process is no different to the process that existed when Labor was in, except we've put more money in towards it. That's the only difference. And so uh, the suggestion that it is somehow... No, no. Councillor Cassidy, please. I appreciate you've asked the question, um, but could you please allow the answer to be heard in silence? The Lord Mayor. Uh, Mr Chair, no, I would suggest Cassidy, that Councillor Cassidy, Cassidy Sorry, is Mayor, not please... interested in Can the answer Lord to Mayor? the question. Councillor Cassidy, please, I've, I've named you twice. Please cease interjecting. If you, if you do not stop interjecting, I will move to the formal processes. The Lord Mayor. Thank you, Mr Chair. Uh, as I was suggesting, it's quite clear he's not interested in the answer to this question. He just wants to use it to score a cheap political point, the same point that failed dismally in the last $2.1 million failed Labor election campaign, uh, because the people of Brisbane knew it was fundamentally not true. They knew that this administration has invested record amounts into fixing footpaths and building new footpaths and building new bikeways. And, in fact, the ultimate example of where Labor hypocrisy uh, stands on this issue is what they do with the funding that I provide them through the budget in their own local wards. Because in a normal year, each councillor, all of us in the chamber, with the exception of me, uh, gets access to over half a million dollars to invest in either footpaths or parks. They have the choice. Half a million dollars a year, every year, but guess what? Today, we've got a submission which boosts up that by another $250,000. So this year, three quarters of a million dollars that they can spend on these sort of things. But look where they actually prioritise funding in their own labour wards. Deegan Ward, of all the money that is allocated, the normal 500,000 a year, um, how many footpath projects in the last 12 months? One. One. 
One, yet it, according to Cassidy, Councillor Cassidy, it is the biggest issue in his area, yet he allocates one, one. And the trend is repeated across uh, every Cassidy, Labor please. ward. No, no, Councillor Cassidy, I've asked you um, a number of times to cease interjecting. Councillor Cassidy, I consider you're displaying unsuitable meeting conduct in accordance with section 21.5 of the Meetings Local Law 2001. I hereby request you cease interjecting and refrain from exhibiting this conduct. Lord Mayor. Councillor Cassidy is so busy trying to play politics with this issue that when he gets money that he can invest into footpaths, he chooses to spend it on something else, just like his Labor colleagues do. Uh, in Forest Lake Ward, of the $500,000 a year, one footpath built. Maruka Ward. Now, Maruka Ward, you're, you're doing well. You're actually lifting the average of your team. Uh, I can see you've got four footpaths here. Lord, but you are Lord the Mayor, living you proof that you can do it. Lord you Mayor, can do Lord it. Mayor, can you please direct all comments through me? I thought you were telling me to sit down. Uh, the, uh, no. the Maruka Ward is lifting the average here. Uh, and and Councillor um, Griffiths does put the money where his mouth is and he invests in footpaths, which is what all councillors should be doing if they have a concern. Now, each councillor has to exercise the judgment on what the priorities are to spend that local money on. But obviously, Councillor Council, Cassidy... Councillor, stop. Please allow... Uh, the, the, the question was asked in silence. Please allow the answer to be made in silence. The Lord Mayor. Point of order, Chair. Point of order to you, Councillor Cassidy. Yeah, um, thanks very much, Chair. I think the Lord Mayor is extremely confused. The question was about footpath replacements, which are capital projects. He's referring to CEF funding, which is a completely different thing. So. Um, just, just, I, trying to, just trying to help the Lord Mayor here, Chair. Saying. I think um, he's very confused. They, uh, the question was, if I recall correctly, will you commit to um, replacements uh, as a part of a COVID stimulus? And part of the COVID stimulus is also in CEF. I, I do see a link there, Lord Mayor. Thank you, Mr Chair. And uh, Councillor Cassidy um, is very quick to ask the politically charged questions, but he doesn't bother to go and read the guidelines of the funding that is provided to him, because you can do footpath replacements through those funds. You can. And there are a number of councillors who have done that. Uh, Councillor Howard, has done it a number of times. Councillor Shree has done it a number of times. It is a matter of... The Lord Mayor, your time has expired. Thank Are you. Are there any further questions? Councillor Mackay. Thank you, Chair. My question is... My ch question is to the Chair of the City Planning and Economic D Development Committee, Councillor Adams. Deputy Mayor, the State Government will soon review whether the Atira Student Accommodation Building in my ward of Walter Taylor will be extended for use as rooming accommodation during the COVID-19 pandemic. As local councillor, I was not informed of the Government's stealthy move to use the building back in April, and there has since been a crime wave in the area. Can you please give us councillors' view no, on the use... No, councillors, please allow, allow the question to be asked. Councillor Mackay? Can you please give us Council's view on the use of this site? Councillor Adams, Deputy Mayor. Thank you for the question. No, no, Councillor Johnston. Councillor Johnston, you're not involved in this. Please, please allow the, the answer to be heard in silence. No, Councillor Johnston, please don't just make gratuitous comments all morning, all afternoon. The, Lord Mayor, uh, the Deputy Mayor. Thank you, uh, Mr Chair, and I know that Councillor Mackay is well across this issue and has been doing everything he can do to support the residents in this area that are extremely upset about this situation and how it's impacting their once quiet and peaceful neighbourhood. It is a really sad thing to see that the State Government and the local State Member have completely washed their hands of the situation. Uh, it's obviously they support the decision to move 300 at-risk residents into buildings designed for students. At the same time, they've completely abdicated their responsibility to the people who live there and want their quality of life back. Public housing is at a chronic shortage. We all know that and we know why. The state government has done absolutely nothing productive to combat the issue with public housing. In fact, in 2016, they counselled the Logan Renewal Initiative, an $800 million project. Imagine the uh, regeneration we would have seen in the economy with that type of money to build 2,600 new public housing homes in Logan. Contracts, contracts were signed, 
uh, buildings were ready to go, point but they order. decided to scrap it without point, any point good reason. Point of order, Councillor Johnston. Yes, Mr Chairman, I'm just checking um, on whether uh, it is appropriate for Councillor Adams to be talking about Logan City Council when she's the planning chair for Brisbane City Council. People are allowed to make comparisons and use examples from other local governments regular, and people are allowed to make examples uh, regardless. You know that. Councillor Adams. Thank you, Mr Chair. We're talking about the 2,600 public houses that Minister de Brenny cancelled in 2016, which is why we see a shortage now in places like Brisbane and right across South East Queensland as well. At Atira, what we see is overnight no consultation with a huge impact on people's lives, no alternative project. Minister de Brenny just decided, who also wasn't the local member for the area, that he wasn't going to have public housing in his area, but we're happy to turn the student accommodation in the Walter Taylor area straight back into rooming accommodation. This was a site that was approved at 33 Glen Road, well-located development closer to Wong Centre, University of Queensland being a short drive away. The developer got significant infrastructure charges um, uh, rebate because they were actually providing something that the uh, city really needed at the time and will need in the future, accommodation for for students in suitable places as well. It's a number of many student accommodation buildings that went up at the time. Fast forward three years later, the state government writes to us and says, we're overruling your approval and we're turning the approved student accommodation into public housing. You have no appeal rights. This wasn't consultation. They didn't seek approval. They didn't even ask our opinion. They just overruled the planning approval and established uh, rooming accommodation in the neighbourhood. The decision was made on Good Friday. Good Friday, early in lockdown, when people were focused on their family, so there was little to no scrutiny being applied. They have a one-year lease over the site for $6.6 .6 million to the owners of that building. This is equivalent of $460 per week, when the going rate for a room was $360 per week. So again, the fantastic financial management of the state government has a $100 increase week rent hike for the building owner courtesy of the taxpayer as well. And it's true, the borders, international and state have been closed, which has hemorrhaged our international student travel, but they will be coming back. Yes, at the moment we're about at half capacity, but why are we throwing out the baby with the bathwater? These students will return. What we see now is an applicant trying to convert that building permanently to rooming accommodation with insufficient car parking and insufficient uh, facilities for this type of use. If we break it down, when the people are looking for international places to send their students to travel, their children to travel, they're going to be looking to Australia, the country that did one of the best out of the world when it came to the COVID pandemic. And break it down further, when you're talking about Brisbane, Sydney or Melbourne, are you going to be picking Melbourne over Brisbane with what we've seen over the last couple of months? Probably not. So we're probably going to see the largest increase of international students once those borders open again, and we need to be ready for that economic recovery when it comes. In addition, it was only three months into this utopian project by Minister de Brenny when there was a 400% increase crime in the local area. A 400% increase, 32 offences in May alone. People can, the police can show you the heat map of the massive increase, which Michael Berkman MP says hasn't even happened. Um, drugs, domestic fights, public drinking, public urination on a daily basis around these rooming accommoda accommodation. Pretty simple stuff. The most practical thing we can do is make sure that this does not get extended for another year. I know Councillor Mackay will be working with his Chawong residents so their voices are heard and that the best outcome for the local the deputy, area will your hopefully time be met. has expired. Further questions? Uh, Councillor... Uh, Johnston. Uh, yes, thank you. My question is to the Lord Mayor. Uh, Lord, well, I, know I really wish I got two questions, but we'll get to rooming accommodation next week. Uh, my um, question is to the Lord Mayor. Lord Mayor, um, the uh, blocks next to uh, the Francis lookout in Corinda are currently subject to one DA, and there are three further DAs to come. Um, the first DA has unfortunately been approved and our community is now advocating for buyback, similar to that uh, done to prevent development in Mount Gravatt East in Councillor Adams' ward. 
Um, residents have written to you about it. There is a petition before council. Will you consider buyback uh, for the blocks adjacent to the Francis Lookout in Corinda? The Lord Mayor. <clears throat> Thank you, uh, Mr Chair. Uh, look, there's a concern I have with the language there because buyback implies that this was somehow government land or council land that was sold. It was not. It's been private land um, and it remains private land. So the idea that we're buying back land or the suggestion that we should buy back land is completely misleading. Uh, council did not own this land and we did not sell this land. Um, so Point of order. I, I am Point not of order sure. Point Councillor Johnston. I'm talking about the land adjacent to the Francis Lookout. That's what my question related to. So I don't know if the Lord Mayor wasn't hearing me. It's the no, residential no, no, blocks no, no adjacent to, to the Francis Lookout. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Councillor Johnston should just have a think about the language she's used here. She claims that we should buy back land. We haven't sold that land. We didn't own that land. It is private land. So uh, it is a, an inaccurate question. Um, I can only assume that she, says she is suggesting we should buy that land from the private ownership that it is in at the moment. Um, the, the premises Councilor of this Johnston, question please don't interject. is Lord that Mayor. there is some kind of impact on the Heritage Listed Park. Uh, we um, uh, are not the arbiter or judge on the heritage impact on that park. That is, in fact, a state heritage listed park. And I am advised that the state government has no concerns about the proposals. Further questions? Councillor Huang. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. My question is to the Chair of the Finance and Administration Committee, Councillor Allen. Councillor Allen, Council's commitment to Brisbane's economic recovery is well underway. Are there any updates you can provide to the Chamber? How is the Australian administration working to rebuild our economy for our city's residents? Councillor Allen. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and I uh, thank Councillor Huang for the question. It is without doubt that COVID-19 has dealt some hard blows to the entire nation and as local councillors we are at the coalface in our communities and see the hardships on the ground at a very human level. We have recognised that the financial impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic have been catastrophic for many residents and businesses and that for many the circumstances are potentially going to deteriorate. The Lord Mayor was quick to act when he established the Economic Recovery Task Force to help coordinate Council's response to the economic challenges facing our city and to ensure our great city was not left behind. While Council does not have the big economic levers of the federal and state government, we have nonetheless been highly active in identifying areas where Council can provide support to the economic recovery of the city. In order to provide additional information and insights into Council's economic response today, I'm pleased to unveil Brisbane's economic recovery plan and I will um, table the plan for the Chamber. This plan, which is now available on Council's website, outlines Council's responses to date, our engagement with the community and businesses and our plans for the future. It details a comprehensive suite of initiatives that have been delivered and more importantly, the initiatives that we are working on and planning to support local businesses and accelerate Brisbane's recovery. Brisbane and indeed the whole of Queensland has made significant sacrifices to stop the spread of coronavirus and this plan gives perspective and confidence to businesses when they need it most. This plan development, developed in partnership with business, industry groups, community groups and residents responds to the challenges and opportunities of our normal, of our new normal and maps a path and a suite of initiatives to support short and long-term recovery. The centrepiece of the plan is Council's $840 million investment this financial year to progress job creating projects now, including key infrastructure projects like Brisbane Metro, fast tracking two green bridges, commencing the Victoria Park project and a multitude of other projects and initiatives. This financial year, local businesses will benefit from a dedicated Brisbane business hub offering support services and advice and campaigns to encourage Brisbane residents and businesses to buy local and enjoy local experiences. 
Brisbane businesses have already received support via a wide range of council initiatives designed to reboot Brisbane's economy in the wake of coronavirus, including seven-day payment terms for small business suppliers, council's buy local procurement policy and a business fee relief package. In fact, more than 10,000 business applicants have benefited from our fee relief package to date, putting money back in their pockets. To help Brisbane residents doing it tough, Council is offering rates relief, including a six months rates freeze for all ratepayers, rates rebates for eligible first homeowners, pensioners and job seeker recipients, as well as rates deferrals and payment plans for those experiencing hardship due to coronavirus. But our recovery effort also includes targeted support for key sectors such as the hospitality and building and construction industries. We're supporting the hospitality industry with fast-tracked food permits for low-risk low applications, free advice and more support and education programs. We're supporting the building and construction industry through rates rebates for first home builders and fast-tracked approvals for home building applications to support an industry that is a major employer. We're committed to Brisbane's long-term prosperity through implementing knowledge and innovation precinct renewal strategies and refreshing Brisbane's city centre master plan. This is not just a plan for the short term, it's a plan that outlines both immediate and long term initiatives. We are conscious that circumstances continue to evolve and accordingly we remain vigilant and agile and will adapt the plan where necessary. We continue to remain engaged with the business community and industry groups to ensure council initiatives can be refined where necessary. The engagement and support has been received from businesses, industry groups and individual business people has been very encouraging. There is a real desire from the Brisbane business community to help wherever they can. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank everyone who has helped out with submissions, responded to our survey and provided invaluable insights to help shape our plan. Whilst COVID is truly an economic disaster for Councillor many people... Councillor Allen, your time has expired. Further thank questions? Councillor Cassidy. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, my question uh, is to the Lord Mayor. Lord Mayor, it's Queensland Walks Week, a community celebration of walking. There's no better time to come clean about your administration's poor record of footpath repair and replacement. We know that Council keeps a conditions report of all footpaths across the city. Lord Mayor, why won't you publish these reports on the Council website and tell the people of Brisbane when you intend to fix and replace those broken footpaths? The Lord Mayor. Thank you, Mr Chair. Um, and uh, in relation to Councillor Cassidy's yet again predictable question, um, he talks about priorities and it's clear um, with the way that he spends his own money in his own ward that footpaths are not a priority because he has spent 10% of the available funding on footpaths in his own ward. Yet he stands up here and tries to score a political point in the same failed way that they tried to do in the lead up to the election, uh, which wasn't uh, resonating with the community of Brisbane because it's simply not true. Uh, but the reality is no administration has ever invested more into fixing footpaths. And what I'm prepared to release uh, because uh, it is such great news is the condition of footpaths under Labor compared to the condition of footpaths now. Uh, because that is the truly telling information which indicates uh, that the questions and the approach that we're seeing now are nothing more than pure politics, but they are based on sheer hypocrisy. Uh, because uh, unfortunately, uh, Labor has no vision and no agenda and no plans. Uh, they have tried to focus on a back to basics kind of approach, yet we're investing in the basics more than ever. Um, so all they can do is take a few photos of some temporary repairs and try and make a social media issue out of it. This is, this is the kind of lame uh, approach that we are seeing from uh, this Labor opposition and it's the reason why they are still on the opposition benches because they have no vision, they're all about politics, they are all about uh, simply opposition for opposition's sake. Uh, and gilding the lily when it comes to the reality of the situation. And that reality is we have lifted the standard right across the city uh, of footpaths and we will continue to do so. Uh, and so uh, when uh, Councillor Cassidy puts up photos of people's private driveways 
um, which are damaged and which are actually the responsibility of the private driveway owner to fix and claims that it's a council failing, um, this is the kind of agenda that Councillor Cassidy and his colleagues are continuing to push and it is fundamentally misleading. Uh, we will continue to invest in fixing footpaths across the city. Uh, we will continue to provide funding to local councillors so that they can prioritise the important local projects. Uh, but Councillor Cassidy doesn't put his money where his mouth is. Uh, he invests only 10% of the available ward funding into footpaths and the other 90% goes into park upgrades. I remember in the past when uh, Labor has used this same line of attack. Uh, that the former Lord Mayor, I think it was Graham Quirk, suggested maybe we should make that local funding just for footpaths and not for park upgrades. And <laughs> Labor councils went silent really quickly after that because guess what? They love spending the money on the local park upgrades while blaming the administration for footpaths when they have the power to fix them if they think they are a priority. Uh, but in the meantime, we will continue to invest record amounts into our maintenance program. And that doesn't just go to footpaths either. Uh, that goes to road resurfacing, that goes to curb and channel repairs, that goes to the whole range of basic services and maintenance across the city that we continue to invest record amounts into. These are not things uh, that are particularly sexy, uh, particularly sexy, but they are important. And that's why we invest the money into them. We know that uh, Labor's record was to uh, forget about those basic maintenance things and to invest on only the things that they saw would win them a few votes. Uh, but that was a failed effort. And we are uh, bringing the city's infrastructure up to standard and we will continue to invest in those basic maintenance things, even if there's not a single vote in it because it's the right thing to do. Uh, and we do the right thing on behalf of the people of Brisbane. We're responsible stewards uh, of the money that they pay in their rates to council. And we will continue to make sure that we invest that money and reinvest it into infrastructure, uh, repairing and maintaining infrastructure and building new infrastructure, because that is what you do when you're in a growing city like Brisbane. That is what you do when you care about the future of the city, uh, because you don't just paper over the cracks, uh, you fix those cracks. Now, temporary repairs in footpaths are one thing, and they are simply to make uh, the footpath safe immediately. And those temporary repairs happen often within hours of it being reported to council. Someone will be out there, make a temporary repair. Why do we make a temporary repair? Not because it looks great, to stop someone tripping over it. That's why. That's the right thing to do. And then we come back later and we fix that footpath. Now, there are some footpaths where uh, simply grinding down raised sections uh, will bring that footpath up to an appropriate safe standard that people can use and people can enjoy. There are also uh, plenty of footpaths which are damaged by third parties as well. Uh, it was a constant bugbear of mine as a local Lord councillor. Mayor, your time has expired. Further questions? Councillor Davis. Uh, thank you, Chair. My question is to the Chair of the Environment, Parks and Sustainability Committee, Councillor Cunningham. Councillor Cunningham, Council is delivering a suite of new wayfinding and distance marker signage along parks and pathways across Brisbane. Can you please outline some of the locations residents can take advantage of these running routes? Councillor Cunningham. Well, thank you, Mr Chair, and thank you, Councillor Davis, for the question. From bushland reserves like Mount Cootha, with its recently upgraded summit track and new spotted gum trail, to the bayside trails at Sandgate and Wynnum with its LED lighting, our iconic Brisbane River Walk, we have a diverse range of running, walking and cycling tracks and experiences right across our beautiful city. One of our newest additions to our paths and trails is new signage specifically to support active recreation, especially running. Avid runners and walkers around the city, New Farm, West End, Kelvin Grove and Mansfield areas will see new signage on their favourite routes to make them easier, safer and more rewarding. They've been installed in four very popular locations across Brisbane, including the picturesque riverside routes from QUT's Gardens Point campus to New Farm, Riverside Parklands in West End, Bishop Street Park in Kelvin Grove and Tillich Street Park in Mansfield. The suite of signage and path decals feature maps, guidance on route difficulty, safety reminders, share the path messaging, directional information and distance markers to make it easy to track your performance along the way for those who are looking to improve their 5Ks. 
The Riverside route follows the river between New Farm Park and the City Botanic Gardens and ties in with our CityCat terminals, meaning you can have a five kilometre run or walk and then hop on a CityCat at the end of the route and make the return trip. Those looking for a longer route can turn around and enjoy the trip back by foot from a different perspective. Starting at Orley Park in West End, we have a five kilometre circuit starting off Drury Street, following the river, through Davies Park and turning back before the go-between bridge. We know that Parkrun is an incredibly popular program across the world with many groups dotted around Brisbane's suburbs. It's about more than just fitness. It's also about social connections with your neighbours and having a bit of fun. Although sadly, Parkrun has been a casualty of COVID restrictions, and while we hope to see it back up and running as soon as possible, Council has made it easier for parkrunners in Mansfield and Kelvin Grove to get their 5Ks in. Tillich Park in Mansfield and Bishop Street Park in Kelvin Grove, home of popular parkrun events, now feature permanent signage and markings, so residents can get their parkrun fix while the organised events are on a break. Council consulted widely in selecting these routes and identifying the required signage, including with world champion long distance runner Benita Willis, including running specialists in training, the Brisbane Park Runs Association and the Road Runners Association. This suite of new wayfinding signs is all about supporting locals and visitors to get around Brisbane, promoting our active and healthy lifestyles. Simple things like route maps and distance markers make going out for a run just a bit easier and help those first-time runners get the confidence they need to get out there and get active. The coronavirus Sorry, pandemic... Councillor Cunningham, can I stop you for a second? Councillors, if you're going to have a private conversation, please do so in the corridors. Councillor Cunningham. Thank you, Mr Chair. Simple things like route maps and distance markers make going out for a run a bit easier. The coronavirus pandemic has changed the way we see and use our public spaces. Brisbane residents were already highly active, but during the COVID lockdown, it became second nature to head out and exercise and explore our city and suburbs by foot. Pedestrian counters revealed that during May to June this year, our monitored pathways saw a 38% increase in usage. Council remains committed to maintaining and improving active recreation options right across our city and suburbs. If it's a hike you're after, we're upgrading trails and lookouts at Mount Gravatt, Capera, Ilden Hill and Stevens Mountain in my own ward. Tui Forest, Whites Hill and Karawatha on the south side and Chermside Hills, Capera Saddle and Boondal Wetlands on the north have different levels of hikes and bushwalks for different ages and abilities. Lord Mayor Adrian Schrinner and this side of the chamber continue to upgrade and enhance and improve our public green spaces and walks right across our city and suburbs. It's another way we're making sure that the Brisbane of tomorrow is even better than the Brisbane of today. Further questions? Councillor Cassidy. Uh, thanks very much, Chair. My question um, is to the Lord Mayor. Lord Mayor, last week you did a media op posing as a wildlife warrior and releasing a cute koala, talking about the dangers facing Brisbane's koala population. One of the biggest threats to koalas on the north side of Brisbane is the loss of habitat at 415 to 427 Beckett Road, Bridgman Downs. You said in previous answers that you don't intend to purchase this land and hope that some negotiated development outcome or court ruling will somehow protect this vulnerable koala um, community. You also voted against saving the bushland from developers by buying the land in previous council meetings. Lord Mayor, will you swallow your pride and stop contradicting yourself and commit to buying this land today? Lord Mayor. Uh, thank you, Mr Chair. And Councillor Cassidy, the, the suggestion um, that my position has been incon inconsistent or changing uh, is simply not true. Uh, to be clear about what's happened with this land, there was a development application lodged and Council refused it. Council refused it. Why did we refuse it? Because we didn't believe that the proposed development was appropriate. And we wanted to see uh, that bushland preserved. Now, uh, as I've highlighted many, many times in this chamber before, uh, with the funding that comes in to this council, 
and the list, the wish list of items that all councillors in the community have, you can't do everything uh, at once and you have to prioritise that funding. Now, when it comes to uh, the development processes in council, um, there are, there's clear precedents, plenty of clear examples of where through the development process and through good development outcomes, large tracts of land and bushland have been protected at no cost to the ratepayers of Brisbane. There's plenty of precedent for that. Plenty of precedent. And there's plenty of precedent of where uh, new parkland and green space has been created through the development process. Now, uh, Labor, Labor's answer to everything is to throw money at it and, and thinking that spending more money gets a better outcome. Well, I actually think that if you can get the same outcome by spending less ratepayer or taxpayer money, that's a smart outcome. And that's what a responsible administration does. Uh, but uh, the real issue here is that uh, Councillor Cassidy is trying to cover up for the failure of his Labor colleagues at the state level. We know that every day it's batter up for the state government here in, um, in uh, Council, that he's only interested in his Labor Party colleagues and protecting them, and he is obsessed with uh, helping uh, his Labor candidates and state members in the, in the next election, and far more obsessed about helping them than the residents of Brisbane, uh, because it is actually Labor's position that has been inconsistent. Uh, Labor has criticised the acquisition of bushland through the Bushland Acquisition Program in LNP wards. Yet here they are claiming in inconsistently with their position, with their publicly stated position, that uh, this LNP ward uh, and the bushland here is different somehow. Um, and so they're, they're the only ones that have been all over the shop here. Uh, but I can tell you this, um, Council refused the application. Why? Because we didn't want to see that bushland developed. As simple as that. Uh, and, and will the State Government buy it, Councillor Cassidy? Councillor, please allow the Lord Mayor's answer to be heard in silence. It's a Mayor. really good question. And in fact, as we found <laughs> Sorry, out... Sorry, Lord Mayor. When I ask people to be silent, that's actually not an invitation to get louder. Please, uh, when I ask you to be silent, please uh, be silent, the Lord Mayor. Uh, thank you, Mr Chair. Uh, as we found out in recent weeks, uh, where Councillor Cassidy scored another own goal, um, I had put the, uh, the um, I guess, the, the challenge out that he should get his state Labor colleagues to call in the application if they were concerned about it. Uh, the date, the cut-off date came and went, yet we heard crickets. Crickets. So the same people that are absolutely intent on starting a bushfire here, um, and I use the, poli the, the political uh, comparison to a bushfire, uh, are the ones who failed to take the action that they could to protect it. And so if you're not, con if, if you're not comfortable with the outcome of the court process, Councillor Cassidy, you and your state colleagues had the ability to intervene in that court process by calling it in. And we've seen, once again, uh, time after time where the State Labor Government has called in an application that has been politically inconvenient. Um, and so I think we saw it up in your neck of the woods, um, uh, in the gap, in uh, the Cedar Woods application, um, Upper Kedron, we saw that. We saw it in West Village, where uh, in the lead up to the election, Labor committed that they would call in the application. They gave everyone a false sense of security and then they approved even more heightened density um, at the end of it. So, uh, look, uh, Councillor Cassidy, we know what you're doing here. We know what your motivations are. Stop trying to stir up local residents with misinformation. The fact is simple. We want to see this bushland protected, which is why we refuse the application, full stop. Further questions? Yep. No, Councillor Adler, Sorry, excuse thank me. Thank you, Chair. Uh, my question is to the Chair of the Infrastructure Committee, Councillor McLaughlin. Councillor McLaughlin, Council will take a motion to the upcoming Local Government Association Conference advocating for the acceleration of open level crossing removals. Can you outline for the Chamber what Council's responsibilities are when it comes to open level crossings and, on the contrary, the State Government's? Councillor McLaughlin. Oh, thank you, Mr Chair, and uh, through you I thank Councillor Atwood for the question open level crossings. Uh, they sure do add to the complexity of Brisbane's transport network. Um, the, the need for rail infrastructure to service many areas within the Brisbane local government area is, a vital, is vital and the expansion of the city's public transport opportunities is crucial. 
However, the intersections of rail lines and major road corridors presents several challenges, including safety risks and increased congestion. Uh, Mr Chair, there are 44 open level crossings across the Brisbane LGA, of which 42 are located on council controlled roads. Almost, although most of the rail crossings intersect with council roads, the rail line itself and the crossings are Queensland government assets and remain the responsibility of the state. To answer the question directly, Councillor Atwood, the removal of these crossings lies in the hands of the state government and the state government should take the lead and pay the lion's share when it comes to delivery of these outcomes. We acknowledge that the surrounding road network is council-owned infrastructure and the removal of the open level crossings improves safety and relieves congestion issues on our roads. So historically, we have partnered with the Department of Transport and Made Roads and QR to remove open level crossings. In the past, council has contributed 15% funding towards the removal of most open level crossings, with the state government contributing the remaining 85%. It remains Councillor's position. Councillor McLaughlin, councillors, please allow the answer to be heard in silence. Councillor McLaughlin. Thank you, Mr Chair. It remains council's position that the majority of the costs for the removal of these state-owned assets should come from the state government. Council is prepared to contribute to the cost of an open-level crossing removal up to a capped $40 million. As Councillor Atwood mentioned, we will be taking a motion to the next Local Government Association conference calling for acceleration of open level crossing removal. The Cross River Rail project, while welcomed, will result in higher frequency of train services on the Caboolture to Sunshine Coast and Beanley to Gold Coast rail lines. This means more frequent boom gate closures and greater delays and traffic disrupt disruption at around 10 crossing locations, including the Boundary Road crossing in Coopers Plains. We have, Mr Chair, a grave concern that the impacts of the Cross River Rail project on the roads the lines intersect will generate more and longer traffic delays. It's apparent that this is not understood or even acknowledged by the state government. It's undeniable that the removal of these crossings needs to be a priority to keep our road network flowing and to reduce um, risks of collisions. Elsewhere on the network, these, this administration has committed up to $40 million towards each removal of the Lindham Road crossing, Coopers Plains and Beams Road crossing in Castledine. It, it is a step in the right direction that the state government has committed funding towards the Beams Road crossing, even if it was motivated by panic to sandbag a marginal seat. <laughs> and the council is ready and willing to play our part in fixing this choke point on on the north side. Our upcoming urban congestion fund project with the federal government to improve the Beams Road corridor will further relieve congestion in Brisbane's northern suburbs. However, Mr Chair, we still have serious concerns about other open level crossings across Brisbane, particularly the Coopers Plains and Lindham crossings. As Brisbane grows, all levels of government need to be adaptable and committed to improving the transport network and to ensuring our transport infrastructure caters for all needs. With committed funds to the removal of these two crossings, we're still waiting for the state government to come to the table. Um, Mr Chair, there's all, there'll always be talk about open level crossings, mainly just before state elections, uh, but this is an issue that needs real commitment and real action from the state government, not just campaign bumper stickers. With Cross River Rail underway and significant projected growth in the suburbs, the time is running out to fix these congestion hotspots. Hopefully the state government will get a move on with other open level crossings across Brisbane to keep our city moving and to make our city safer for all road users. Thank you, Mr Chair. Thank you. That uh, concludes question time. Uh, councillors will now move to the consideration of committee reports. For those who are not aware as well, in front of me is the sign-on book. It will not be distributed around the room. Please approach it one at a time to sign on uh, if you have not done so. The Lord Mayor. The uh, Establishment and Coordination, uh, Coordination Committee report of the 10th of August, please. Uh, thank you, Mr Chair. I move that the report of the Establishment and Coordination Committee meeting held on Monday, 10th of August 2020, be adopted. Seconded. It's been moved by the Lord Mayor, seconded by the Deputy Mayor. The report of the Establishment and Coordination Committee meeting dated Monday, the 10th of August 2020, be adopted. Is there any debate, the Lord Mayor? <clears throat> 
Uh, yes, uh, I uh, just wanted to start by acknowledging a few important days, uh, landmarks and community uh, causes, um, as I do. Uh, obviously, on, um, uh, on the weekend, we had the official uh, celebration and commemoration of the 75th anniversary of the end of the war in the Pacific, uh, which was effectively the end of the Second World War. Uh, it's hard to believe uh, it's been 75 years since the end of the Second World War, um, but it's also, um, it's interesting to, to imagine that this building was standing in the Second World War and this building was actually a recruiting office in the Second World War. Uh, and there were many historic buildings in Brisbane, like MacArthur Chambers, which were critical in the war effort. Um, and so uh, I was very proud to see um, the projection on the front of City Hall commemorating uh, this important milestone. Uh, the only disappointment, I guess, or real shame, is that uh, we couldn't have uh, more people out um, celebrating this really important milestone um, due to COVID. Uh, so the, the celebrations and commemorations were quite small and subdued, uh, but they are nonetheless uh, critically important. Um, and the role that Brisbane played in the war and the role of so many of our uh, young men and women uh, who lost their lives um, is something that we should never, ever forget. As part of the projection, uh, there was a scrolling list of uh, more than 30,000 names on the side of City Hall uh, which represented the Australians that died in the Second World War. We also uh, had, um, in recent days, uh, some important national uh, days or celebrations uh, for the local uh, Indonesian community. There was the Indonesian Independence Day. Uh, and for the Indian community, there was the Indian Independence Day as well. Normally, these are events that we would celebrate together um, with events like the India Day Fair, or the Indoz Festival, but unfortunately uh, this year those weren't possible either. So I did want to pay tribute to uh, locals uh, in the Brisbane community um, with Indian heritage uh, or Indonesian heritage uh, and thank them for the role they continue to play in our city and its diverse multicultural community. Uh, on Thursday and Friday this week, uh, the Victoria Bridge and Story Bridge and Radcliffe Place sculptures and the Tropical Dome at the Botanic Gardens will be lit up uh, red in support of Brick by Brick, uh, which is organised by Young Care, uh, a fantastic local organisation and charity uh, which supports the needs uh, of young people with a disability, an organisation that effectively exists because until they started, uh, rising up to meet those needs. Um, there were many young people with a disability who had no choice but to go into aged care homes. Uh, and so you may have a teenager, a 20-something year old in an aged care um, facility because there was nowhere else for them to go. Uh, and that is truly sad. Um, and so young care exists to help meet that need. Uh, they've opened up some great facilities uh, recently in Woolawan, uh, which is just fantastic. Um, and those facilities are specifically set up uh, to meet the needs of those young people and they have plans for more exciting uh, facilities going forward. On Sunday, uh, the Victoria Bridge and Story Bridge, the Sandgate Town Hall and uh, Redcliffe Place and City Hall uh, will be lit up uh, red and white to support We Care Day. And this is uh, something that is uh, supported by the Council on the Ageing or, the, um, or COTA as it other, otherwise known. Uh, and it's designed to uh, protect the, uh, and advance the rights, needs and interests of Queenslanders as we age. Um, the final day of Queensland Seniors Week, um, which is the 23rd of August, we'll be celebrating with a day of recognition for the Care Army called We Care Day. Next Monday uh, marks Queensland Road Safety Week. Uh, and we'll be lighting up the Victoria uh, Story Bridges City Hall, Tropical Dome and Redcliffe Place in yellow uh, in, uh, in acknowledgement of that important uh, safety event uh, and campaign. And also finally, uh, today uh, marks Vietnam Veterans Day. One of the, the terribly sad things uh, on the weekend was to see the dwindling numbers of veterans from World War II uh, that are still with us. Uh, and it won't be too far into the future where there are no longer any World War II veterans with us, um, but we very much have 
uh, many Vietnam veterans with us. Uh, and whether they were um, uh, voluntary enlisted uh, soldiers, soldiers, sailors and airmen and women, uh, or whether they were conscripted, um, our Vietnam veterans deserve recognition. Um, I recently, uh, on uh, a recent weekend, had the opportunity to, um, to view that Australian movie, Danger Close. Has anyone else seen that, about the Battle of Long Tan? Uh, in, it, it, was, um, it was a tearjerker. But just a reminder of what our Vietnam veterans had to go through, many of them uh, who were just 19, um, at such a young age, conscripted, sent overseas to the jungles of a foreign land, um, and many who, of whom never came back. Uh, so today we commemorate all of the battles fought by Australians in Vietnam uh, and uh, we will remember your contribution uh, to our country and our community. Moving into the uh, formal items before us. Item A uh, relates to some, some tidy up and finalisation work for the corridor upgrade on Telegraph Road. Uh, this is one of the many projects uh, where our administration has invested in the outer suburbs of Brisbane, upgrading the infrastructure and road network and bikeway network and walking infrastructure with new roads, footpaths and bikeways. Uh, and uh, this project was one that we did uh, to be timed uh, to finish in time for the Gateway North upgrade to be completed. And so it was a great example of Council investing in its network to support the investment that the federal government and to a lesser extent the state government was making in uh, the motorway network. Uh, and uh, so that's been a great project. Uh, and this is about uh, finalising some of the land transfers and dedication of road reserve uh, that needed to happen with that project. We uh, have at item B, um, the Wakerley Bikeway project. Um, and once again, this is a similar type of submission which uh, relates to land needs for a, the creation of a new bikeway connection. Uh, this is along Rickett Road in Ransom. Uh, this is uh, a gateway to the city from um, Redlands City. Um, and uh, this is a corridor that we have invested heavily in with the, uh, the recent upgrades uh, along that corridor, um, where Council, together with the Federal Government, invested in the Green Camp Road corridor upgrade. Uh, we're also about to, together with the federal government, invest in the upgrade of Rickett Road and Chelsea Road at Ransom. Uh, and uh, as part of that, uh, or as a, an additional added project, we'll be uh, working to create um, safe cycling and walking infrastructure along what is a rural road at the moment. Um, and so this uh, is about the land requirements for that. Uh, items C and D relate to uh, the green bridges at Kangaroo Point and Breakfast Creek. Um, and as I referred to earlier in the meeting, uh, this is one of my uh, first commitments as Lord Mayor to progress these green bridges, uh, and we are getting on with it. The Kangaroo Point Bridge, uh, in particular, has been talked about for around 100 years. We're going to build it. We're not going to talk about it anymore. We're going to build it. Uh, and while uh, there's still uh, ongoing consultation to be done, what we know is this. Uh, the uh, residents uh, and the community of Brisbane uh, want these projects to happen and they want us to get on with it and that's what we're doing. Uh, and what we know is that these projects uh, will help uh, to provide new active and healthy links into our city, to provide connections where there are no connections uh, and to also provide a critical stimulus to our economy and to local businesses and jobs at a time when we need it the most. Now, uh, we will continue to work to seek funding from other levels of government, uh, but we are not going to wait around uh, until they bring their budgets down. We need to get on with these projects. Uh, if we are to wait until either the state government or the federal government brings down their budget, um, we see potentially many more months of delay we also uh, see the uncertainty about whether there will be any funding in the next budget uh, at either level of government. We need to get on with these projects and create jobs, uh, and that is what we will be doing. We will still continue to advocate and lobby strongly for uh, funding from the state and federal government for these projects, uh, and acknowledging that until now, uh, pedestrian and cyclist bridges uh, in Brisbane have traditionally been funded and built by the state government. Uh, and until now, 
projects like Kangaroo Point, uh, Pedestrian Bridge, and in fact, Newstead to Tenerife. Lord Mayor, your time has expired. Thank you. Move for an extension. Second, seconded. Seconded. It's been um, an extension of time has been moved by the Deputy Mayor, seconded by Councillor Hutton. All those in favour, please say aye. Aye. And, and those against, no. The ayes have it. Lord Mayor, would you mind just turn your microphone off and then back on again and your time will restart. OK, thank you. Uh, and um, acknowledging that um, until recently, um, those two bridges were actually uh, identified as state government projects, which were um, in the past designated as important projects at the state government level. Uh, since then, uh, we have seen no action and no progress. Uh, and, and in fact, until recently, uh, we saw pure obstructionism from the state government where um, there was this ridiculous idea that people in super yachts were more important than the people of Brisbane um, and the Kangaroo Point Bridge was going to be jeopardised by a super yacht trial. <laughs> Thankfully, we've had some common sense prevail um, and we're getting on with the project and I thank the state government for uh, getting out of the way in relation to that. But what they can do to help is to allocate some money as part of their stimulus efforts towards these projects. Uh, because that will help uh, us deliver more going forward uh, and provide more for the people of Brisbane. And they are quite clearly projects that are state government priorities or should be state government priorities because they are originally proposed uh, by the state government in, in a number of cases. Uh, we have heard some speculation um, uh, about where uh, an additional Greenbridge or a fifth Greenbridge should go. Uh, and thank you, Councillor Cook, for your strong support of the Green Bridges program. Uh, we appreciate that support. Um, but I did do some digging around uh, on this, and oh, I, yeah, <laughs> I, um, I uncovered some interesting information. Um, because we have heard in the past, and I've mentioned just before, that the state government had proposed a, a Green Bridge between Tenerife and Balimba. And, and there was a familiar ring to this. I'm like, haven't we heard this talked about before? Um, and yes, indeed, we have. Minister Hinchliffe um, claims uh, back in 2016 that 125,000 has been allocated in this financial year through the Queensland Transport and Road Investment Program uh, to undertake preliminary option analysis for a shared bicycle and pedestrian bridge from Tenerife to Balimba. This investigation commenced in late 2015 and is estimated for completion in mid-2016. Has anyone seen this report? Has anyone seen the outcome of that investigation? Um, because I certainly haven't, but um, I do know someone in this room who has an in with Minister Hinchliffe, and I would be very keen to see that report because I know that the Deputy Leader of the Opposition will be keen to see it as well, um, because it might assist in her in advocating for local residents uh, for that fifth Greenbridge. But given that there's some state work that's already happened on this, uh, let's have a look at that first before jumping in um, uh, blindfolded, effectively. So, um, Councillor Cassidy, clear mission for you. Please help us to get access to that report that was uh, due for completion in mid-2016. And then we can make uh, a judgment on whether that's a good idea or not. Um, but having said that, uh, we're moving ahead with the first two bridges. Uh, we will, if necessary, fully fund them. Uh, we would prefer to partially fund them, but we know the importance of driving jobs, of building infrastructure right now, uh, and we're getting on with it. Uh, this project in particular, or this uh, significant procurement plan that we see in front of us, uh, will deliver a couple of things. Uh, first of all, the Kangaroo Point uh, to the city uh, uh, Greenbridge or pedestrian and cyclist bridge. Uh, it has, uh, we've, we've done significant work on this bridge already when it comes to the planning and design. Uh, we're out there today and there's test drilling that is underway for ge geotechnical investigations. Uh, and uh, that's really exciting uh, to see that work progressing. And on Friday, we'll also be briefing uh, the industry as well on uh, how they can get involved now that we're gearing up the procurement process. Uh, I do ask for the support of all councillors for these uh, two SCPs because they are really critical. Uh, they are good projects. Uh, and when it comes to the second one, uh, the Breakfast Creek uh, Greenbridge, but also, importantly, uh, a major part of this project will be the extension of the Loris Bonnie Riverwalk. 
the Loris Bonnie Riverwalk has been a fantastic success uh, as we've upgraded Kings of Smith Drive. Uh, and uh, we can see every day thousands of people using that bit of infrastructure. Uh, but as we know, um, you get to the end of the Loris Bonnie Riverwalk and uh, it gets to a quite narrow and quite precarious uh, pathway that certainly doesn't meet current standards or expectations uh, and effectively directs people to a relatively narrow footpath along a very busy road. Uh, so what we want to do is we want to extend the Loris Bonnie Riverwalk and in fact approximately half of the budget of this bridge will not be on the bridge itself but will be on upgrading extending and extending the Loris Bonnie Riverwalk. Uh, Riverwalk structures themselves are effectively bridge structures. Um, they are not cheap, um, but they're really important um, infrastructure assets for the city. Uh, and so we'll see uh, approximately 67 million uh, invested into both the bridge and also the extension of the Loris Bonney uh, Riverwalk as well, which is a complementary project to the bridge. Uh, that will give people uh, the opportunity then to connect into Newstead Park uh, and to connect into other parts of the uh, active transport network, including uh, existing sections of Riverwalk further down. Um, and uh, that way people uh, will have some choices coming off the, the great Kingsford Smith Drive, Loris Bonney Riverwalk. Uh, we know that as Hamilton North Shore continues to grow, the demand for um, active transport will continue to grow as well. And uh, we also know that it is an important part of uh, people's day uh, that they get their daily exercise. And if you live at Hamilton North Shore and you work in the valley or the city, um, getting that morning or afternoon ride or walk in um, is an important part of an active and healthy lifestyle and we want to make it easier and support that uh, activity. But also that helps reduce traffic congestion on the road as well and is part of a more livable and sustainable uh, city. These two projects are estimated to create uh, 500 jobs at the peak of construction uh, and we're looking forward now to engaging with um, the industry to finesse the design of those two structures. Uh, and uh, what I can say is that uh, the reference design for Kangaroo Point and Breakfast Creek, if that was the ultimate design and that was what uh, is built, I'd think they'd be fantastic. Uh, but I suspect that through this process of engagement with the industry, that design will get even better. There will be further improvements made Point of order, uh, and uh, we'll Point see of order that to process you, continuing. Will, Councillor Sh uh, will the Lord Mayor take a Lord question? Mayor, will you take a question? Sure. Please proceed, Councillor Shree. Thanks, through you, Chair, to the Lord Mayor. I'm obviously very excited about the Kangaroo Point Bridge in particular. I was just wondering, I, I read in the documents reference to shading for the pedestrian part of the bridge. Would you, would you agree that there should also be shade or roofing structures for the cyclists, given that cyclists aren't waterproof? Lord Mayor. Uh, thank you for reading the document, Councillor Shree, through you, Mr Chair. Um, and look, uh, definitely shading uh, is something that we aspire to provide on these structures. Um, one thing you, you've got to bear in mind is the practicality of trying to shade a structure um, which we're trying to limit the visual impact of, um, but also a structure where in the morning the sun's coming in from this way and in the, in the afternoon it's coming in from this way um, and only during the middle of the day will that structure provide, you know, so there, there's, there's some challenges to shading a structure like a bridge. Um, so we will do our best, we will work with the industry to try and provide as much shade as possible to the users of that bridge. Uh, but I do know one thing, uh, it takes a lot longer to walk across a bridge than it does to cycle across a bridge. Um, and so uh, for that reason, uh, pedestrians are prioritised. Um, but having said that, if we can get shade that, that benefits both users, uh, that's a great thing as well. Uh, and uh, while we're talking about shade on bridges as well, I note that um, uh, Jackie Trad, um, the member for South Brisbane, uh, has put in a request to council for um, shading to be considered for uh, the Victoria Bridge, uh, and that is something that we are having a look at. Um, we need to determine um, whether the structural integrity of the bridge will allow that. Uh, we need to build that shade in a way, uh, if we're going to build it, that, um, uh, that will not jeopardise the structural integrity of the bridge. It is designed as a very slender uh, bridge. Uh, but also any um, funding that the state government could put towards that project would be welcomed. 
uh, and any assistance with uh, various aspects of the project that help us fast track Metro would be uh, very much welcomed. Um, and then we can all have a win-win situation um, that benefits uh, the, uh, the wider population of Brisbane and also those local residents in South Brisbane uh, that will be walking or cycling across Victoria Bridge too. Uh, so um, there's a lot of exciting things happening and um, uh, particularly excited about these two projects and the significant contracting plan and I do ask for all councillors to support these items uh, as they're important infrastructure projects at this time. Finally is the uh, Suburban uh, Priority Project Fund which I referred to before. This fund, Councillor Cassidy uh, and others, uh, you'll be interested to know that you can use this to repair or upgrade or build new footpaths. You can use well, it for other things as well. Expired. Move for an extension, seconded. Extension moved by the Deputy Mayor, extension and seconded by uh, Councillor Hutton. All those in favour say aye. aye. The contrary, no. Aye. The ayes have it. Lord Mayor, please continue. Uh, thank you. I um, love the irony of Johnston um, saying that 30 minutes is enough. We all think that when you talk too, <laughs> Councillor Johnston. Um, but uh, <laughs> actually, it's never just 30 minutes. <laughs> it's usually one hour and 30 minutes, two hours. Right, um, no, that's enough. Yeah. Back, back to business, please. <laughs> um, uh, but as you'll see in this item... Uh, no, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> no, silence please, the Lord Mayor. We've provided a, a boost for local councillors to be spread evenly right across the city to invest in local priority projects. Uh, and these are not the big infrastructure projects that, um, that you know, we traditionally think about with stimulus. Um, these are local projects and an opportunity to engage, uh, in many cases, uh, local contractors, uh, an opportunity to support um, uh, the, the great uh, community assets, parklands out in the uh, suburbs of Brisbane. And so these, uh, this priority fund will allow councillors to invest in park improvements, footpath improvements, active transport infrastructure projects, community facility infrastructure projects on council managed land. Uh, and uh, these are the type of things that um, I know local councillors will be really, really keen to see money invested in. And I look forward to seeing the proposals and projects that they put forward um, from this fund. The important thing is uh, we need to get that investment happening this financial year um, and uh, that's, a, that's a boost on top of the normal 500000 per councillor that's provided through the Suburb Suburban Enhancement Fund. So uh, I look forward to seeing uh, this funding rolling out equally across the wards of Brisbane and uh, know this will deliver some great community outcomes. Further speakers? Councillor Cassidy. Uh, thanks very much, Chair. I rise to speak on uh, all of these items before us today, um, and we'll just start from the top. Uh, so on uh, the Telegraph Road Corridor Upgrade Stage 2 project, um, this uh, item before us is, I suppose, the very, very last um, stage of this project. It formalises the land use changes um, due to the roadworks, which were completed, I think, in December 2018. Um, the um, works are long completed, obviously, and some of the land which uh, was parks reserved now forms part of the roadway. Um, there were several parcels of land that were resumed um, on what was uh, or is the Bill Brown Reserve and was the home of the Bramble Bay Pony Club, which were um, unceremoniously kicked out uh, by this administration um, subsequently, but um, that's the land of which uh, we're talking about here, as well as the easement uh, with Powerlink uh, and Energex. So this is just a very um, uh, formalisation of um, that project, as is Clause B, um, the subdivision of that land to enable the Wakeley Bikeway project um, to uh, proceed through there, that parkland at 60 Rickett Road. Um, so those two are very um, straightforward. On clauses C and D, I'll talk about um, those concurrently. Um, chair, there the stores board submissions for council um, uh, to sub, uh, seek EOIs for design and construction of the Green Bridge at Kangaroo Point uh, and another at Breakfast Creek. Um, the, um, and I think we all know and uh, the people of Brisbane are, are rapidly finding out that the, uh, the Lord Mayor's much vaunted Green Bridges plan that he announced when he uh, was appointed Lord Mayor was more an election pitch uh, than planned infrastructure at the time. 
this uh, Lord Mayor Chair announced it was great fanfare, but in reality they were just dots on a map. Now we know that the um, Breakfast Creek Bridge uh, is a sensible extension of that um, bikeway through there, and the Kangaroo Point Bridge is something that has been talked about ad nauseum for some time and something that we've been on the record of supporting and proposing uh, for a long time. Uh, but the, the overall plan, which the Lord Mayor announced uh, way back then in April um, of 2019, uh, was supposed to be transformative, and there was some great graphics that um, his office or the LNP had done up. I suppose the um, Council and the LNP are one and the same when it comes to and the polling in which they do, uh, Chair, but, you know, he, he's now claiming that uh, it is all jobs, jobs, jobs uh, in today's re-announcement. Um, but we know from uh, his own figures that he's released that those jobs won't be coming online until 2023. Uh, so the jobs that uh, will be needed here today uh, in Brisbane uh, are jobs, again, in the construction industry, in civil construction, um, uh, and um, good jobs like curbside collections, for instance or constructing new footpaths and fast-tracking their basic infrastructure and basic bikeway infrastructure uh, out in the community. Uh, so the, the rhetoric of the Lord Mayor here today in re-announcing what is something that he had, has largely already announced so many times over and over again that we've lost count um, uh, is pretty paper-thin, uh, Chair. Um, we have amazing missing links uh, in our suburbs, and we know there are missing links in getting people to and from each end of these proposed green bridges, even um, the one that will be um, fast-tracked in three years' time at Kangaroo Point. Um, there's amazing uh, a lack of infrastructure at either end of those, and um, of course the 2,000 kilometres of broken and dangerous footpaths around our city that we know about that is still sitting on the to-do list on this Lord Mayor's Watch. We know that Brisbane is now on this administration's own figures that they released last week, swimming in garbage after the Lord Mayor scrapped curbside collections. But he is more interested today in putting out expensive fly-throughs um, of a project that is sometime uh, happening in three years' time than dealing with uh, the issues that are facing our city today. Uh, we're not saying we don't support green bridges. Uh, we um, have proposed the Kangaroo Point Green Bridge in the past and uh, have been on record as supporting green bridges and more river crossings uh, here uh, in the River City. Uh, but this Lord Mayor is using this um, as an opportunity um, over and over and over again to um, not talk about the issues um, that need to be talked about here in Brisbane. Now, the other thing, the other interesting uh, thing that the Lord Mayor let slip uh, today in the, in the media um, the, around these green bridges was the cost. Now, we were told the um, cost was largely commercial in confidence, but the Lord Mayor's media release put it out there for everyone to see, and that the, um, uh, the, total, um, the total cost of these bridges uh, is half of um, the budget going forward for all of the green bridges. So he proposed five green bridges and committed at the election to building five green bridges. We're now seeing two of those being rolled out uh, that are the uh, simplest and cheapest to build, that are using half of the budget that is available. So, when you look at this Lord Mayor's track record, it's becoming quite evident what is going to happen to the Green Bridges program. Uh, he, is the, he is the king of cost blowouts, Chair, this Lord Mayor. Uh, the, um, the IT project that he signed off and designed uh, as the finance chair in this council uh, was $27 million down the toilet and nowhere to be seen. Uh, when he was infrastructure chair in the council here, chair, uh, he designed and signed off on the Kingston Smith Drive project, which was 12 months delayed, and 100% of the available contingency was used. A worst case scenario project on this Lord Mayor's watch. The Metro, which when he was public transport chair, um, Mr. Chair. Councillor Cassidy, I appreciate your, your building an argument. Can, can I please draw you back to the, the bridges specifically? Thanks, Chair. So, so we know from the Lord Mayor's own admission uh, that yeah, he is the Lord Mayor of cost blowouts. He has admitted today uh, that these bridges, uh, this bri bridge program will be a cost blowout. When you look at the size of the, um, the bridges that are being built, Kangaroo Point Bridge um, is a pretty substantial structure um, and the, uh, the, um, the bridge over the Breakfast Creek is a fairly small bikeway extension. So if those two are costing close to $260 million, uh, you, you don't have have to um, go to much length to realise that to realise 
the three extra bridges um, sometime in this term, we assume that's not going to happen now, given the time frame of fast tracking, um, is going to um, lead to a cost blowout far exceeding the $300 million cost blowout on the Metro, far exceeding that. So without some uh, amazing intervention from other levels of government, he likes to blame other levels of government for everything, left, right and centre and previous administrations and me uh, and everyone else. Uh, but he is going to go cap in hand to other levels of government because if he can't get that funding from the state or the federal government, chair, we know that the bite is going to be put onto the ratepayers of Brisbane. He said he's going to spend $550 million on these projects. Uh, we know that half of that uh, is now being eaten up by the two easiest bridges to be built. What happens to the other three? Now, we know that Councillor Adamant got one knocked off. Uh, the, the Lord Mayor said that uh, there, that will be moved to another, uh, another location. Uh, Councillor Cook has been on the front foot from day one uh, and is leading uh, the charge to consult the community east of the Story Bridge about that location. But really big questions remain to be answered, Chair, by this Lord Mayor. Which of those bridges are going to be scrapped to stay on budget? Or what rate rises will we be seeing uh, in the forward estimates and the out years of coming budgets? Um, to fill the black hole that uh, his pre-election commitment has created. And they're the questions that have not been, um, have not been answered by this Lord Mayor. Uh, on clause E, Chair, uh, COVID-19 Suburban um, Projects Fund. Uh, we've heard this Lord Mayor and this administration um, talk up their COVID-19 response um, but in reality, at every turn and every time you scratch the surface about something that is supposedly a response to the economic crisis that's about to face our city uh, from COVID-19, um, uh, the reality is most of the funding for most of these projects uh, are being sought from the state or federal government, as we um, saw over recent weeks, Chair. Um, uh, and again, this goes back to this Lord Mayor loves to apportion blame um, to everyone else, but then when he needs to get things done, he goes cap in hand to other levels of government. I think people are starting to rapidly see through that approach that this Lord Mayor takes. Uh, what we do need, uh, and what we needed at budget time, and we've needed every each and every week, is a uh, Lord Mayor who's willing to show up and to support the community and invest in the projects that will make a difference now, that will make a difference in the coming months, uh, and over the coming years, not uh, these projects, gold-plated projects, um, that are off in the never-never. Um, what we got in the budget was a half-baked plan. Uh, Chair, it wasn't um, a COVID response. Um, this Lord Mayor is more than happy uh, to be um, spending you know, $6.5 million a year advertising himself, $800,000 on market research and polling to see how he's doing, um, but he... You've got five seconds from... Oh, there we go. All right. An extension. Councillor Cassidy, your time has expired. I move for an extension. An extension of time moved by Councillor Cook and seconded by Councillor Griffiths. So, as you can see, it will flash for the final 30 seconds. To start again, just push the button. Start and push it again. And should start again for you. You perhaps need a oh, vote try, on that, try it. Aye. Yeah. Aye. Aye. And all right. Now, I'll put, the, I'll put that resolution. All those in favour, say aye. Aye. Those against, say no. The ayes have it. Yep. Thanks very much, Chair. There we go. Just 10 more minutes to go now, everyone. That's, we'll be wrapping it up rapidly. Um, I guarantee it'll be less than the Lord Mayor. Um, uh, so, as I, as I said, uh, $800,000 on market research and polling. Uh, that, that's, where, that's where this Lord Mayor's priorities are, um, Chair, um, not on the so-called suburban priority projects, which is just $270,000. And the Lord Mayor uh, went to some lengths during question time and ENC just now, um, talking about footpaths specifically, um, trying to intimate that the funding that is allocated under the previous, you know, um, Ward Parks and Footpath Trust Fund and the current um, Suburban Enhancement Fund in this project is supposedly all about repairing broken footpaths. Um, that has never been the case. Um, those funds were designed to install new infrastructure in the community, whether it is park upgrades and embellishments or new footpaths. We know that um, barely 20 per cent of Brisbane's streets have complete footpaths in them. 
Um, there are some 6,000 streets that don't have any footpaths in them whatsoever. Um, so that very meagre funding, uh, the $270,000 plus the half a million dollars that is allocated, uh, if you spend all of that on new footpaths, uh, might do um, might do a couple of complete streets a year, if you're very lucky. If you've got a large street, it might do one street a year. So for this Lord Mayor to get up in here, um, Chair, and try to muddy the waters and say, oh, well, the, the, the real reason that um, footpaths, uh, dangerous footpaths that are crumbling underfoot are not being fixed is because Labor councillors aren't using... Yeah, that was, my, that was one that was my fault, uh, Councillor Cook, that's right. Um, sometimes it's Jim Sawley's fault, sometimes it's Clem Jones' fault, Peter Beattie's fault sometimes. <laughs> Uh, this one, this one was definitely my fault, Chair. Apparently, uh, that um, the suburban enhancement fund wasn't being used by Labor councillors to fix the dangerous and dodgy footpaths that are crumbling under people's feet. These are footpaths that are causing significant harm to people. I had a lady who um, tripped on uh, LaSalle Street in Brighton come into my office uh, early last year. She sustained significant, significant in injuries. And when council officers went out and inspected that footpath, they had to grind down 60 spots on one street to make it a, a temporary fix. And a replacement has not been programmed uh, for that street. Um, no replacement is in sight. The only replacement I've seen of a footpath that is in desperate need of it was the footpath that an elderly woman died on in Seymour Street in Sandgate, Chair. So for this Lord Mayor to get up and say, there is nothing to see here, um, this, um, uh, this problem we have in Brisbane is all Labor councillors' faults because you're not using the Suburban Enhancement Fund and this new um, COVID priority fund to fix the problems that the budget should be fixing. There are there is items in the budget for footpath um, restoration uh, and replacement. Uh, and new footpaths are understood to be done under the Suburban Hanson Fund and now this project. So I don't accept that um, at all whatsoever. I've had council officers uh, come to me this financial year and beg me to use some of the Suburban Enhancement Fund um, or funding in this um, to help replace um, dangerous and dodgy footpaths because they're so concerned about them, but they're not receiving the funding and capital, despite submitting those requests at, a, at an officer level uh, with a high priority year after year after year after year after year. So this year I've agreed uh, with my council officers to replace the dangerous footpaths along Flinders Parade at Brighton on the Brighton foreshore because despite election commitments from this Lord Mayor, he's not put one single cent uh, into fixing the dangerous situation on the Brighton foreshore and 19th Avenue in Brighton, uh, where, um, which leads from the foreshore to the Brighton Health Campus, uh, where a lot of people who are having uh, rehab um, and uh, people who are some of the most vulnerable in our community are living um, access that and that is a, a pathetic footpath through there. So, uh, so Councillor Murphy thinks the system works where council officers are forced to go to a councillor and beg that they use a suburban enhancement fund um, to fund projects that should be funded under capital. That's what Councillor Murphy is saying. That if, if he thinks that system works, that system stinks, Councillor Murphy. That system stinks. We've got a Lord Mayor who's more interested in spending $6.5 million a year advertising himself and marketing himself than fixing footpaths in our city, some of the most basic things that a council can do. I mean, if that is the priority of this administration, uh, Chair, I think people uh, would rightly be outraged, and they will when they hear about that. They will when they hear about that, Chair. Uh, and uh, I think it is um, unacceptable that the Lord Mayor um, gets, away, gets away with saying it's everybody else's fault but his. I mean, a real leader would stand up and say, uh, right, there are real serious issues out in the community, uh, particularly at the moment as a COVID response. Uh, we want to get jobs rolling out immediately in our community. Uh, instead of talking about jobs in 2023, how about we talk about jobs uh, in August, September, October, November and December of 2020 and actually start investing in our suburbs? Further speakers? Councillor Allen. Uh, thank you, Mr Chair. I rise to join the debate on item E, the COVID-19 Suburban Priority Projects Fund. Um, as I mentioned in the Chamber earlier, COVID-19 has significantly changed the way we live and do business in Brisbane and indeed across the country and the globe. And we know that the economic impact will be felt for some time to come, certainly many years. 
In recognition of the challenges being faced, Council has implemented significant measures to soften the economic blow that the residents, ratepayers and businesses of Brisbane will endure. These measures include rates relief through rebates, rates freezes and deferrals, initiatives to encourage Brisbane residents to support local business and undertaking work to identify future growth, new market and business opportunities. While the economic recovery of our city is crucial to supporting the lifestyle we have enjoyed in Brisbane, much of what happens across the city is very localised and nobody knows their local communities better than local councillors. Councillors have a good line of sight to projects across their wards that will not only support economic activity but have a discernible payback for their local communities through improved amenity and social inclusion. And I would note that social isolation has been a real impact or has been as real an impact uh, during the coronavirus period as the economic impacts. And funds like this will help to deliver things which will encourage people to get out and about, improvements to our parks, improvements to community facilities, and anything we can do to reignite community engagement is a good thing. Now, to support this, Council implemented the COVID-19 Suburban Priority Projects Fund. And I would note this is a, a one-off initiative designed to deliver ward-focused projects designed to generate small business engagement, elevate local things to see and do and breathe life back into our neighbourhoods and revitalise the community. And as the Lord Mayor noted, each ward will have access to $270,000 and a total of just over $7 million. And in uh, reference to some of the points Councillor Cassidy made, the, the, the $6 million man from Deegan, and I quote, Councillor Cassidy has been on the record as saying, $6 million is not much in the scheme of things. So he probably thinks $7 million isn't a lot of money. But for me, personally, I think $7 million is a great contribution to helping support our communities. And I, for one, and delighted that I'm getting an extra $270,000 to support the community in Northgate. Now, these projects preclude things such as park improvements, footpath improvements, active transport infrastructure projects, and community facility upgrades on council-managed land. So there is a significant range of projects that these funds can be directed to. And certainly, I'm sure all councillors have a list of um, projects where this type of funding can be directed. And given that this is a one-off opportunity, and I'd point out there's no provision for carryovers, I really encourage all councillors to start to engage with their officers to get these projects moving. And so, COVID-19 hasn't just taken its toll on our economy. In some cases, it's reduced our ability to interact socially and reduced our ability to be involved in our community. So I would really encourage councillors to maximise the use of these funds. Thank you. Further speakers, Councillor Johnston. Uh, yes, thank you, uh, Mr Chairman. Uh, I rise to speak on items C, D and E. Um, just firstly, with respect to items uh, C and D, um, I'm, I, I would like to be able to debate this properly, but unfortunately we can't because um, of the commercial in confidence um, restrictions that have been placed on, uh, on the paperwork before us today as council. Um, but I am concerned about the a phenomenal amount of money that's being invested um, into these two bridges. Um, I certainly understand and think that a new bridge from Kangaroo Point um, across uh, to the Botanic Gardens is a great idea. The Botanic Gardens in the city is such a fantastic resource for our city and um, better access to it and that part of the city I think is a very positive thing. Um, beyond that, I think that there's been very little um, discussion uh, with um, councillors or with the community about where the other green bridges should go. Um, I note that um, when the LNP decides where they want to put one, they'll go out and consult with residents and then can only still manage to get 60% of those residents to agree that that's a good idea. Um, and that's the figures for out at Breakfast Creek. Um, it's just such a shame that we don't have proper discussion about where these green bridges should go. Um, and, you know, I see speculation again today um, in the um, 
uh, in the Brisbane Times Online that they're now looking at another one from West End to Toowong on the ABC site. Um, so, you know... Um, uh, yeah, thanks so much for your contribution. Uh, it's not in these papers before us today, so it's still speculative at this point. But I thank the Lord Mayor and Councillor Adams for both interjecting then. They're going to be really happy to buy back this parcel of land to prevent development on the site. Um, but that's not something that they're prepared to consider out in Corinda. So I'll again mention that to my residents when I see them, um, that they're happy to buy back land in LNP wards um, to prevent development from happening, but they're not prepared to do it um, in other parts of the city. So thanks for that interjection. It was well-timed. The other thing that concerns me in the paperwork before us today, and this is really quite extraordinary, there are, as we've heard from... Uh, as we've heard from um, uh, the Lord Mayor, uh, there is some $550 million being invested in the Greenbridge um, program over the next four years, about which half is going to be spent in these uh, two bridges um, at Breakfast Creek uh, and Kangaroo Point. However, the biggest problem in the Council papers before us today is this, and I quote, um, this is about the request for tender and the expressions of interest standard to be used. So this is the briefing information that we are giving to the private sector to bid for projects worth hundreds of millions of dollars from Council, and I quote, The RFT will be based on documents used by the Indrapilly Riverwalk, Radnor Street, Stage 1, modified to reflect the specific requirements of the BCGB project. We're about to spend several hundred million dollars without specific paperwork being undertaken. In my view, that's unacceptable. Um, Council needs to do um, all the proper planning and preparation now um, before the project is committed. And this is why projects in this Council continue to go bad. If they are not properly scoped, not properly explained to the private sector, if they're not properly tendered, um, if there's the right details not provided, um, then we absolutely um, get bad outcomes. Um, you know, working for a major contractor for many years, you, same thing. You, if a project starts badly, it's going to end even worse. So I have concerns that we are being asked to endorse hundreds of millions of dollars today um, on the basis of, well, we'll just use the same paperwork we used for the Riverwalk. So um, that, is, that is a really big concern to me. Um, and I really don't believe that Council's done um, enough homework and the proper homework to support the expenditure of hundreds of millions of dollars of ratepayers' funds. Um, we need to do the due diligence first um, before putting these projects out to tender. Uh, finally, with respect to item E, the Suburban uh, Priority Projects Fund, there's a couple of things I want to... Oh, sorry, just to finish off on that, um, and I suspect, like Councillor uh, Cassidy, um, that the Green Bridges program will go a bit like the Trans Apex uh, project that uh, Newman uh, announced uh, in his Lord Mayoral bid. Um, it started off with doing one or two, and then the rest of them just never happened or the state took them over. Um, so uh, it looks like this is... He's learnt a few things in his time uh, with Campbell Newman, and that's how to watch um, uh, a promise uh, uh, dissipate over time, and he just hopes people will forget. Well, I don't think they will. Uh, item E. Um, I just want to say a couple of things about this firstly. Um, the Lord Mayor uh, today has been very critical about footpath um, projects, but I, I think there's a lot of new councillors in the chamber, so I just think we should talk about what actually happened with all of these um, projects. When I started, councillors used to get um, a proportion of infrastructure charges directly into a trust fund, which was able to be used for parks projects. Um, and where development was happening in particular areas, that money was reinvested back into um, those local communities where development was happening. And that was a pretty fair way to do it, to be honest, um, because uh, where there's a lot of growth, um, there needs to be an upgrade to services. Now, that was for parks projects. Now, Campbell Newman scrapped all of that in 2009, and then this parks... Um, parks footpath project was 
The Parks Woolpath project was uh, started to um, allow... Point of order, Chair. Point of order to you, uh, Councillor Shree. I'm sorry, so many councillors in the chamber are talking, I'm having difficulty here in the no, speaker. No, thank you. Uh, councillors, please allow the speaker to be heard in silence. Councillor Johnston. Yeah, um, and then uh, in 2009, the fund was introduced for parks projects, and that was for new parks projects. Um, and then a few years later, it morphed into under Quirk, uh, sorry, uh, Graham Quirk, it morphed into, well, we'll just add new footpaths into that. Um, and then now under this Lord Mayor, it's morphed into <laughs> road works, footpaths, um, you know, and it's only gone up a couple of hundred thousand dollars. Now, as it turns out, we've heard today, um, the Lord Mayor wants us to fix old footpaths as well as build new footpaths. And the amount of money has only gone up by a little bit. We're getting this one-off additional amount of money, which can be used for small projects in our wards. Um, but the amount being used in my ward, $270,000, the same for all other councillors, is less than what the Lord Mayor is spending on marketing research and surveys um, just in the past year. So I don't think the Lord Mayor is um, prioritising this funding in the right way. We do have more people staying closer to home and our parks, footpaths and bikeways are busier than ever. We don't really have bikeways out my way. Um, there just aren't any. Um, there's some yellow bikes painted on the bitumen, but, you know, they're not bikeways. Um, so I remain very concerned that we're just not investing enough um, into the existing um, local areas. The Lord Mayor then picks and chooses to fund millions of dollars out of the capital portion of the budget into certain wards. And Tennyson Ward has missed out for the best part of a decade. Only last year did we get the first parks capital project in a decade in my ward. And that was a playground at Turley Street in Fairfield. Um, so, you know, it's there's a very unfair... Um, allocation of resources around all of the wards in this city. We all get the basics, but then some wards also get the gold-plated extras. Um, as I have always done, always, um, I split that money between parks projects and footpath projects. Um, certainly it's just for the purposes of weighing up how much all these projects are and which ones were ready to go. The other thing, I mean, I got my, my requests in back in July, um, but we were told they had to be projects that were ready to go almost immediately. Um, so there is one footpath project from this 270,000 and two parks projects. Um, and finally, I just want to say um, the Lord Mayor um, cut the Lord Mayor's community funds this year from $75,000 to $34,000. He voted against establishing a scheme to approve grants funding um, and said no. He intends to just blame the state government for the restrictions they've put on discretionary funds. Yet here we are today approving a new um, process for the approval of $270,000 in funding from the Suburban Priority Projects Funds. It just demonstrates that this Lord Mayor only wants to play politics. The Lord Mayor's community funds Councillor could have Johnston, had a similar your time scheme. has expired. Further speakers? Point uh, Councillor Hutton. Point of order to you, Councillor Hutton. Mr Chair, I now move that the Council adjourn for afternoon tea for 20 minutes, which commences only when all councillors have vacated the chamber and the doors have been locked. Seconded. It's been moved by Councillor Hutton, seconded by Councillor Adams that this council now adjourn for a period of 20 minutes for the purpose of afternoon tea, commencing when all councillors have vacated the chamber and the doors have been locked. All those in favour say aye. Aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. Thank you, councillors. Welcome back, councillors. Uh, further speakers, Councillor McLaughlin. Oh, thank you, Mr Chair. I rise to speak on items A and C in the ENC report. Um, Telegraph Road corridor upgrade project, the uh, res resumption of land or the completion of the resumption of land, and also on the uh, Brecky Creek Bridge, which I'm looking forward to. Just briefly on item A before us, as has been said by other speakers, this is the completion <laughs> Of, uh, of works or the, uh, the the handing over of works, recognising that the this is now road reserve. It was 
former park or designated as park, but not uh, not brilliant bit of park. So this is now a um, the recognition of that transfer of land to to acknowledge it now as road reserve. This was uh, work that was undertaken. Uh, and completed in 2018 under the uh, former chair for infrastructure, Amanda Cooper, uh, and uh, I'm sure her delivery of this great project will be recognised in the forthcoming contest for ASPLE, uh, because uh, Councillor Cooper, as the infrastructure chair, was certainly responsible for getting great outcomes for this city and for the north side of the city, and I know she will continue to do that work as the uh, member for ASPLE. Um, as, uh, as was mentioned, this is uh, a widening of the corridor and this formally dedicates the land utilised for the, for the road project. There have been uh, over 4,500 new trees planted uh, and uh, 68,000 ground cover plants planted in the project area as part of the upgrade. So um, while uh, we, we um, see the necessity for road upgrades, um, this was one that allowed for a, uh, a fairly lengthy corridor, 4.3 kilometres to four lanes, uh, certainly improves the, uh, the flood resilience, delivers better active travel infrastructure, uh, that new signalised crossing on Lemke Road, uh, new cyclists and pedestrian underpasses on Depot Road and Lemke Road, online bike, lane, bike lanes and new shared paths. So a good outcome all along, uh, but I believe that there's no great controversy in this place about the uh, rededication of that land. In relation to item C, Mr Chair, um, this is the uh, procurement strategy for the delivery of the Breakfast Creek Greenbridge Bridge, uh, extending it into the Loris Bonney River Walk. Um, this is, uh, Mr Chair, an excellent outcome. I commend the Chair, Councillor Murphy, for making sure that a diagonal design uh, is the design that we're proceeding with, uh, cutting across from the Loris Bonney River Walk to the, to the uh, uh, southern side of the existing Breakfast Creek Bridge, uh, a great outcome. And I thank him for being the champion for that particular design, because I know this is a, a design that we'll see uh, deliver great outcomes for the residents of, of Brisbane in my ward and elsewhere across the whole of the city. We see thousands and thousands of people using the Loris Bonney River Walk, but currently there's no logical connection for them when they get to that end at Breakfast Creek, and uh, this will be a, uh, a great outcome when this bridge proceeds. Um, I heard Councillor Johnson earlier talking about the procurement process, and uh, I, th there's one thing that Councillor Johnson and I have in common. Uh, that, 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 that is, we both... We, we both worked as uh, public affairs uh, managers for infrastructure companies, for engineering firms um, in, in our past. Uh, but the, the one, the one but that's where it ends, because from that point on, I, I don't claim to be an expert on all things engineering as a consequence of, of working, as working for a, as a spin doctor for an engineering firm. I, I do that, leave that to the experts in the field. Uh, I'm pleased to do so. And that, and that does relate to the, the procurement process processes that are involved. Look, uh, we, we step through a process that Councillor Johnson said she does not support. I do support because it provides for early uh, uh, intervention by the potential contractors to get involved in the final design. Um, the strategy that Councillor Johnson says we must have is to do a, only a design and co construct, that is giving the finished product to constructors and making them build that. Well, the process that we'll be going through, we went, we're going through it for the Indrapilly Roundabout and the process process is the same here as outlined as the delivery options under uh, in item C from 27 through to 30. It outlines the, the model that allows for early tender involvement and that's a good thing. That's a good thing. It means that if there are any issues associated with the design from the City Projects Office, the, those who are likely to be involved in constructing it can get involved in making the final design. No, 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 Councillor. So, uh, I, as opposed to Councillor John, who's finally just rejoined the chamber, uh, coming from wherever she's been, uh, I, I say this is a good process to allow for early tender I, involvement in the process for I construction. It allows for collaboration uh, and it allows for getting projects underway as quickly as we possibly can to provide for great outcomes. Thank you, Mr Chair. Further speakers? Councillor Strunk? Oh, well, no, Councillor Strunk, please. Now, Councillor Strunk, have you got your card? Uh, I have to leave it here. Okay.
please proceed. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Listen, I'm just, um, I wasn't going to say anything in regards to item A, but uh, Councillor McLaughlin um, um, informed us, actually, which was, which was quite amazing that there was a little bit of pork barreling going on out there uh, for um, uh, the former uh, councillor, Councillor Cooper. Bingo. And uh, who was probably always going to run for that seat. Um, and uh, so she, uh, she front-loaded a lot of stuff, no doubt. Uh, but maybe I'm being a little bit... Uh, but cynical there. Uh, but I just want to speak about uh, item E, uh, which is the suburban priority projects. And uh, as, as all councillors have done, Mr. Chair, we, we sort of sat down with officers probably at this stage and have worked out uh, where we'd like to uh, spend that money, that $270,000. But, um, which was, you know, we're never going to, uh, you know, push that away uh, because uh, there's many projects uh, in my ward that I've been trying to get uh, funded uh, over many years, um, over the last four years, if that's many. And, uh, and uh, it, but the money always seems to be spent, or the large amounts of money seems to always be spent in the, uh, in the CBD or the inner city suburbs. Uh, and our allying suburbs are missing out. Uh, pretty much all the time in, uh, in, 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 in for these large projects I'm speaking about now. And that's uh, upgrades of uh, intersections and things like that. But um, the reason I wanted to speak on this one is because uh, there was two, uh, well, there's two projects, but similar in scope. Uh, the first one is the, uh, the installation of a, um, a, a uh, amenities block in a, uh, in a park called Kev Hooper Park, which is the largest park in my, uh, in my ward, um, which is um, probably, over in, in, probably in the last four or five years, it's, we've been, been gradually putting a bit of infrastructure in the park, uh, and this will sort of finish off um, what I wanted to do, and uh, so that $270,000 came at a, at a timely, time, timely manner, uh, and, uh, but, it's, but I also wanted to upgrade the one at uh, DJ Sherrington, which is uh, where our skate park is as well. And hopefully there'll be enough uh, money to do that. But really, you know, it's a small amount of money for the amount of ratepayer money that goes into the coffers of Brisbane City Council every year from my ward and other wards as well, of course. So we found out in the uh, questions on, on notice um, uh, that uh, $34 million goes to, into the coffers of Brisbane City Council from my ward. And really, you know, um, yes, you're giving us $270,000 for this particular uh, uh, fund for this one-off year, right? But really, um, if a look at how much actually is coming my way from this last budget was uh, $6.5 million out of the $34 million uh, that uh, goes into the coffers. So, uh, I thank the Lord Mayor for giving us the 270000 I'm not going to be disingenuous about that, but I would have thought that the projects out in the suburbs should have been a bigger priority than the projects inside the suburbs or inside the CBD area and or surrounding um, inner city suburbs. Uh, but it seems that's where the investment seems to always flow, and it's really sad that, um, that we, we do without in the outer suburbs. and. Uh, I'll just uh, finish my comments here. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Further speakers? Councillor Shree. Thanks, Chair. I'll just keep it really quick. I just had a, um, with, regarding the Kangaroo Point footbridge, um, I'm gen generally supportive of this, obviously, but I have my usual concerns about outsourcing to private contractors, and I think it would be better if Council maintained a structure where it, it could undertake these major projects in-house. I obviously won't go into that debate here, but I did just want to query the um, 12 month period for uh, con lot defects and, and warranty and just to understand is that defects liability period slash warranty period where it says minimum 12 months is that fairly common or for a larger project like this might we want to be insisting on a longer defects period in case something emerges and if the mayor could speak to that briefly I'd be interested in the response. Further speakers? Yes. Councillor Griffiths. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Look, I, I um, have to get up. Uh, in light of what the Lord Mayor said earlier and said that I, I was only uh, building four footpaths, I did actually sign off on others yesterday, so his records might be a bit behind. But like, we have um, Ferry Street, Beatty Road, Watson Road, Beverly Hill Street, Lyon Street, Koala Road, Kane Street, Helly Street, 
Luxworth Street and Hanson Parade, either full or in part, being built. Uh, and this money's come in really handy. It's been really useful, and uh, I've tried to get that. And I've tried to get that money out as quickly as possible because I could spend double this amount of money if anyone has any left over or if they can't spend it, my ward could really benefit from it. Uh, in relation to um, also, this weekend we start work outside the Rockley Hotel build, rebuilding or reconstructing the footpath out there. And I know Sam, the owner of that hotel, is very happy with that work as well. So once again, welcome this money. And any more money the Lord may want us to throw our way or give our way, I will get it into the community as quickly as possible. Thank you. Further speakers? Councillor Murphy. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Chair. I rise to speak on item B, C and D. Uh, item C, the significant contracting plan for the Breakfast Creek Greenbridge and the extension of the Laura's Bonnie Riverwalk. And item D, the significant contracting plan for Kangaroo Point Greenbridge. So I'll speak to those first. Now, following uh, the first phase of community and stakeholder engagement, which occurred in late 2019, Council is now embarking on the next phase of community consultation uh, for both of these bridges, and we will commence engagement with industry around procurement opportunities. The draft reference design for the Kangaroo Point Green Bridge and the concept design for the Breakfast Creek Green Bridge will be released for a four-week uh, period in the coming days on the 24th of August. So procurement for the delivery of both of these bridges will start with uh, calls for expressions of interest from industry in mid-September. Uh, the EOI phase will launch at the same time for the Kangaroo Point and Breakfast Creek Green Bridges. The procurement process for both projects will be different and run separately due to the unique nature of each bridge, and I'll go into a little bit of detail about that in this item. So first of all, uh, to the Kangaroo Point Green Bridge. The Kangaroo Point Green Bridge will provide a world-class gateway to the city centre and the Kangaroo Point Peninsula, making it easier for those who want to explore the CBD reach of the river by foot, bicycle or e-scooter. Residents will enjoy enhanced access to dining and entertainment precincts such as Riverside, the Eagle Street Pier, River Stage, the Queen's Wharf redevelopment, the Howard Smith Wharves and South Bank, enabling them to spend more time enjoying Brisbane's unique Riverside lifestyle. Imagine on a Sunday morning being able to stroll from the Riverside markets in the city over to the Green Bridge and then on to CT White Park for a picnic or enjoying the day at Captain Burke Park and then jumping on an e-scooter, gliding over for an afternoon in the City Botanic Gardens. The Green Bridge will provide better connections between residential, employment and entertainment and lifestyle precincts. It will mean both commuter and recreational cyclists can easily travel from Brisbane's eastern suburbs, including East Brisbane, Norman Park, Hawthorne, Bulimba and Morningside to the CBD and onwards, including to South Brisbane and West End. And residents of Kangaroo Point will be able to access railway stations and the busway network that are currently beyond a comfortable walk for the vast majority of them. A bridge connecting Kangaroo Point and the city centre has been, as the Lord Mayor has said, uh, in the pipeline since the 1860s, but it's taken this Lord Mayor and this administration to actually get the job done, and that's what we're starting today. Council recommended detailed planning in 2014, and in 2018 engaged consultants to undertake further technical studies on the bridge, including providing recommendations on the preferred alignment, uh, the landings, and of course, bridge design options. In September 2019, Council released the project's preliminary business case key findings, which demonstrated the benefits of the Kangaroo Point Green Bridge and the value for money that it presents to Brisbane ratepayers. The preliminary business case identified a preferred alignment on the corner of Alice Street and Edwards Street uh, to Scott Street at Kangaroo Point. This alignment provides for a safe and accessible connection and a very gentle slope on the bridge and at the landing points and more direct, uh, direct connections to existing pathways. Following strong support from the community on the preferred alignment during consultation in late 2019, Council undertook further technical investigations and assessments in early 2020 to inform the draft reference design. The draft reference design for Kangaroo Point Greenbridge has now been finalised and outlines the final bridge alignment, landing points and its structural form. Key features include a elegant single mast cable stage structure designed to complement the city skyline and minimise visual impact. It includes a variety of viewing platforms and rest nodes to pause and to take in the expansive river and city views that will be offered from this bridge. 
The draft reference design has been informed by a range of technical studies and investigations, including an analysis of the bridge alignment and form options, flooding and environmental assessments, and consideration of visual and social impacts, as well as community feedback. This includes input during the design development from groups representing people with disabilities, so uh, groups such as Spinal Life and Guide Dogs Queensland to ensure that the bridge is highly accessible and meets the needs of all users. The final design of the bridge will be refined throughout late 2020 and 2021, following outcomes of community consultation on the draft reference design. Now, um, as to the next steps. The successful contractor uh, will be responsible for the design and construction of the Kangaroo Point Green Bridge. The procurement will involve an early contractor involvement process, or ECI process. The uh, expression of interest phase will commence in mid-September 2020 and will seek interest from potential contractors who are capable of undertaking the required works. Now, this is a collaborative tender process in, um, which, in which shortlisted contractors will have the opportunity to engage with Council's uh, transaction team. During this ECI process, shortlisted tenderers will participate in interactive workshops to inform the development of the detailed design and increase their familiarity with the project and its construction requirements. At the end of the ECI process, the shortlisted tenderers will finalise their design and, of course, their price. During the interactive RFT stage and ECI process, the tenderers will be encouraged to request clarifications on risks, assumptions and raise design issues that may benefit the project as a whole. The RFT uh, stage, including the ECI process, is expected to be completed in early 2021, with the final contract being awarded by mid-2021. This model will provide the best opportunity for industry participation in tendering, and it also provides the best outcomes for the project, and importantly, for ratepayers who are paying for it. Now, the Breakfast Creek Green Bridge will provide missing active transport link uh, from the inner city all the way to North Shore Hamilton via the Newstead Riverwalk and the Laura's Bonnie Riverwalk, which was delivered as part of Council's Kingston Smith Drive upgrade project. Following the resounding success of the Laura's Bonnie Riverwalk, um, used by more than 500,000 pedestrians in, and cyclists in 2020 alone, and 2020's not over yet, uh, the Breakfast Creek Green Bridge will activate a previously underutilised part of the Brisbane River, connecting the city's northern suburbs with the CBD. It will make travel even easier and more attractive for both commuter and recreational cyclists by providing a better link to the city's primary cycle route from Brisbane's northeast suburbs to Newstead and the Brisbane CBD. It will connect businesses and employment opportunities in Newstead, Tenerife and Fortitude Valley and the city centre with growing lifestyle precincts at North Shore Hamilton and of course Racecourse Road. It will mean greater connectivity between growing North Shore Hamilton PDA and the popular Newstead Gasworks precinct, two uh, significant residential, employment, entertainment and lifestyle precincts for our city. Following positive uh, community feedback during the initial consultation late last year, preferred alignment for the Breakfast Creek Green Bridge has been identified. The alignment's been selected because it provides a comfortable and accessible connection, as well as minimising impacts on key heritage places. In respect of this design, the Breakfast Creek Green Bridge will take advantage of the unique heritage and landscape setting, offering views to Newstead House, the Brisbane River and the Breakfast Creek Hotel. Council sought input from key local stakeholders, including the Newstead House Trust, the Department of Environment uh, and Science, to ensure that the bridge integrates with the unique heritage and landscape setting of Newstead House. Key, uh, key features will include a distinctive uh, twin arch span uh, with dedicated pedestrian and cyclist pathways and a new landing plaza at Newstead Park with integrated urban design features. The Breakfast Creek Green Bridge will be delivered using a collaborative early tender involvement procurement process. This is a uh, process in which shortlisted contractors have an opportunity to provide input uh, into the design. The ETI process facilitates interactive sessions between the shortlisted contractors and the designer throughout the detailed design phase. This will start with an expression of interest phase in mid-September 2020 in parallel with the Kangaroo Point Green Bridge process. The ETI process will also facilitate uh, <clears throat> will also finalise the design and then issue the request for tender documents for construction. Um, this procurement process is expected to be completed in mid-2021 with the RFT process to commence in the second half of 2021 and the final contract to be awarded late in the year. As we deal with the impacts of coronavirus, we're really getting on with the job of creating uh, new 
jobs and supply opportunities sooner. The draft reference design for the Kangaroo Point uh, Green Bridge and the concept design for the Breakfast Creek Green Bridge will also be released for a four week community consultation period on Monday the 24th of August 2020. Community feedback will play a crucial role in developing each bridge and I encourage residents to have their say on the latest designs as we move closer to construction for these city shaping projects. Thank you very much, Chair. Further speakers? I see no further speakers, the Lord Mayor. Uh, thank you, Mr Chair. Uh, it feels like a while ago, but um, Councillor Cassidy asked two questions which I would like to answer. Um, and uh, those questions were, uh, and I'm using his words here, uh, which of the Greenbridge projects will be scrapped? Um, and secondly, what rate rises will occur to fund the Green Bridges? Okay, uh, so it's important that we actually be clear that what the commitment was on day one, uh, when I stood up on day one as Lord Mayor and made this commitment to the people of Brisbane. Uh, I said that we would invest in a program of Green Bridges. I said that we would invest $550 million and I said that that investment would be over a 10 year period. Uh, so it's interesting how, according to Labor, uh, the situation morphs and they claim I said different things, but that's exactly what I said on day one. Uh, I originally proposed uh, five locations for Green Bridges, but obviously those locations are subject to community feedback and community consultation, which is an important part of any program or agenda. Uh, I remain committed to investing $550 million over the 10-year period on uh, five green bridges. Now, it has always been the case that those green bridges would be funded in partnership with other levels of government. We have been clear about that from day one. Uh, we would put in $550 million. Uh, we would be seeking actively from other levels of government further investment. Given that, uh, as I said before, these projects would normally be delivered by the state uh, in the same way that Brisbane Metro is a project that would normally be delivered by the state and we're taking on the responsibilities to fill the gap and the vacuum that is left by the state and their underinvestment in public and active transport. Uh, but I remain clear to this day, we will invest $550 million in green bridges over the 10 year period. And in fact, as we know, uh, we will be bringing forward uh, more than $250 million of that spend into the immediate projects right now. And that's called fast-tracking for those uh, playing along. Uh, we're fast-tracking it. And uh, I did want to also um, comment on those questions. So, provided the other two levels of government come to the party and put in funds towards these projects, there should be no projects that are scrapped. Simple answer to a simple question. Uh, on the question of what rate rises will occur, uh, well, I can say uh, I'm proud to lead an administration that delivered the first rate freeze in 35 years. That is something that Labor could never achieve. And in fact, what they could achieve is the exact opposite. We saw uh, in four, four different please. years uh, rate rises of 6% or more under Labor. That is their legacy. That, that Can, never Councillor, happened. Sorry, Lord Mayor. Councillor Johnston, uh, please cease interjecting. Lord Mayor. That never happened under an LNP administration. Yep, it was their record uh, on more than four occasions, 6% plus rate increases. Yet this year we have delivered the very first rate freeze in 35 years. Uh, and that is a record that I am proud of. And we will continue to work hard to keep rates as low as possible while catering for the needs of a growing city. Uh, so uh, rates um, uh, will not be impacted by green bridges. We have budgeted 550 million, just as we said we would. That is already in the budget and it is already budgeted over that 10 year program. And in fact, we're bringing forward 250 million of that into the coming uh, years uh, so that we can fast track two of those projects. Now, as I've said, uh, if the other levels of government come to the party, we can do more. Uh, and I'm very keen to continue those conversations. Uh, I know that uh, the federal government, in particular Minister Alan Tudge, uh, is very interested to continue working with us on a whole range of projects, whether it's Brisbane Metro, uh, whether it's road upgrades in the suburbs through the better 
uh, Roads for Brisbane initiative, jointly funded by the federal government, or whether it's an opportunity for the feds to put in money towards green bridges. Uh, we're, see we're seeing very positive outcomes and discussions happening there. Uh, I'm also confident that the state government will finally realise that green bridges are uh, also, at least in part, their responsibility. Uh, and then they should be coming to the table as well. Uh, we would like to, in the immediate term, see the uh, report released that they did into the Belimba and Tenerife um, bridge potential. Uh, I'm very keen to see uh, the outcome of that report, uh, but um, in the meantime, we'll continue progressing with these important job creating projects. Uh, there was, surprise, surprise, a false claim or two made by Councillor Johnston. And that claim related to infrastructure charges uh, and the changes associated with um, infrastructure charges in a particular ward fund. Now, I remember that as well. Uh, coming uh, next month in September, I will have been a councillor for 15 years. Um, and I remember the fund that Councillor Johnson was talking about. And I also remember why it changed. It changed, now does this seem familiar, as a result of changes in state legislation. But of course that wouldn't stop Councillor Johnston blaming me for those changes or blaming the administration for those changes. Point of order. Like Point of order uh, to you Councillor Johnston. Claim to be misrepresented. <coughs> um, no, uh, it's that's been noted but okay, Lord Mayor. It's just flashing red, is that what it's supposed to do? There's a reason for that. No, yours is fine, just, just <laughs> turn it off and it'll be alright. Yeah, it'll just reset in a moment. Well, Mr. Mayor. Chair, like she did with the recent changes to the Lord Mayor's Suburban Initiative Fund, or the Lord Mayor's Community Fund, as it's now known, which were driven by state legislation. Now, to remember what Councillor Johnson's argument was, is that the state wanted to limit discretionary funds, and she's like, well, let's do a workaround to that. Yeah. Let's still have discretionary funds, but let's, you know, let's find a loophole so we can keep having discretionary funds. Uh, no, the state law is quite clear. Um, there should be a limit on discretionary funds. But that's fine. Councillor Johnson, if you want to blame me uh, for your political purposes, um, let's forget about the facts. You can keep doing that, but we know what the truth is. And just like the previous changes to infrastructure charges, which were driven by changes to state legislation, um, they were changes that we inherited. But there's an interesting outcome of those changes, because previously infrastructure charges revenue would come in towards based on uh, developments being approved and built in a particular ward. Now, that was the old scheme. The new scheme is that every councillor gets the same amount of money across the city. So let's weigh this up. If you're a councillor, say, that opposes every single development application that occurs in your ward, how much money would you expect to get in under the old system? Not a lot. But Councillor Johnson gets an equal amount to everyone else under the new system. Um, so, on the one hand, you can criticise this new system, but Councillor Johnston, um, through you, Mr Chair, your ward is a big beneficiary of that system because you get an equal amount as every other councillor. Uh, whereas if it was based on the level of development activity, um, then Councillor Shree would probably be rolling in the money, um, uh, but we know that uh, every councillor gets an equal amount, and I think that's a fair way of doing it, to make sure that the suburbs of Brisbane get investment as well. Uh, and we do that in a very fair and equitable way, uh, and we will continue to invest across the suburbs in uh, important infrastructure, large and small, uh, and we are very proud of our record there. And whether it's footpaths, whether it's bikeways, uh, whether it's road upgrades, whether it's active travel infrastructure, uh, whether it's major projects, um, uh, we believe uh, that uh, the suburbs of Brisbane um, uh, continue to grow and they deserve that investment and they deserve that investment to be shared uh, around the suburb as need arises. So uh, we're doing that. When it comes to the two green bridges, uh, I've made it clear we will invest $550 million into this program. Uh, we will get more from this program if other levels of government contribute. We will be actively seeking that to happen. Uh, but I am really excited about these two projects. I think the procurement process that has been put forward today, as Councillor Murphy and Councillor McLaughlin have suggested, is a good one because it captures uh, the uh, creativity and innovation and experience of experienced constructors and contractors and designers and engineers. And so councils put our plan forward of what we think uh, would be a good outcome. 
and it will only get better from there with the input from uh, the engineering firms and construction firms uh, who have experience in building these kind of assets. Uh, Councillor Johnston sees that as somehow a negative thing. Uh, this is a positive procurement process. Uh, this is a process will which will deliver better outcomes for the people of Brisbane and which will deliver better projects as well, uh, Mr Chair. So I commend uh, these reports to the Chamber and in particular the two SCPs and I ask all councillors to please vote in favour of those documents. Councillor Johnston, you had a uh, misrepresentation. Uh, yes, thank you, Mr Chairman. Um, the Lord Mayor stated that I had made false statements um, regarding the uh, changes to the infrastructure funds in 2009. Um, they were changed by this council, and I stated clearly that they were done by okay. Campbell Newman. No, thank you. That, that's, uh, not so the Lord Mayor. You're drifting into argument country. Um, all right, thank you. I'll now put the resolution. All those in favour of uh, the NC report say aye. Aye. And the contrary, no. The ayes have it. Division. Division called by the Deputy Mayor. Second. Councillor McLaughlin, please ring the bells. Point of order, Mr Chair. Uh, so, just to be clear, we're voting on all items at once here, is that right? Good. Yep. Attendants, please close the bars. Oh. I, I don't think so. I think I'm going to have to make a choice. I think you're going to need to, you're going to need to make a choice. All right. My microphone is on. Yes. All right. All right, um, now we're voting from our seats. Uh, all those in favour, please say aye and raise your hand. Aye. Thank you, everyone. Please lower your hands. Those against, please say no and raise your hand. And those abstaining. We got one. All right, clerks, please read the result. When you're ready, no rush. No, seriously, I'm not. Mr Chair, the uh, ayes have it, the voting being 26 in favour and one abstention. Thank you, the ayes have it. Councillors, we will now move to the city planning report, please. The Deputy Mayor. Mr Chair, I move that the report of the, the uh, you get it wrong. <laughs> City Planning Economic Development Committee held on Tuesday the 11th of August 2020 be adopted. Seconded. It's been moved by the Deputy Mayor, seconded by Councillor Landers, that the report of the City Planning e Economic Development Committee meeting dated Tuesday the 11th of August 2020 be adopted. Is there any debate? The Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Mr Chair. Last week in committee we presented the City Reach Waterfront Master Plan, uh, which we released to the public last week after nearly two years of working with the community and the landowners. From the City Botanic Gardens down to Howard Smith Wharf, this is 1.2 kilometre stretch of a waterfront, which is already a popular leisure destination with a mix of high value professional services and riverside dining. Uh, the vision that we announced last week will build on this existing infrastructure to improve connectivity to the waterfront with ample room for pedestrians and cyclists to safely move through and more green space, shade and seating to stop and enjoy. It's all part of Council's broader plan to connect people and places around Brisbane quicker and safer. But the promenade is so much a destination, it's, almost, it's also a movement corridor. This plan is very supportive of growing recreational and tourism activities in this area to enhance both the day and nighttime economy, including the possibility of temporary floating restaurants and bars and more river access infrastructure. It will take some time to see this vision come to light. There is no time frames on the delivery, but we'll be working very closely with landowners along the riverfront to ensure we get the best possible outcomes as opportunities arise as well. And I commend the presentation to the Chamber. 
Further speakers? Further speakers? No? Deputy Mayor? I'll now put the resolution. All those in favour say aye and raise aye. Uh, aye. And excuse me, that's an old habit from Zoom. And those against say no. The ayes have it. Division. Division called by the Deputy Mayor. Seconded. And Councillor Second. Howard, please ring the bells. Councillors, the resolution is to note the information contained in the report, yeah. OK? All right. All right, councillors, those in favour of the resolution, please uh, say aye and raise your hand and hold it there. Thank you. And those against, please say no and raise your hand. The ayes have it. But clerks, please uh, count, do the count and read the vote as appropriate. Mr Chair, the ayes have it. The voting being tw 23 in favour and one against. Well, so one, one abstention, sorry. Um, I'm missing. Are you sure it's not tw 26 sorry. and one? Sorry, Mr Chair, that was a miscount. Um, so we've got, uh, sorry, the ayes have it, the vote voting being 26 in favour and one abstention. Thank you. Thank you. The ayes have it. <laughs> well, I counted it as an abstention because she left when the vote had come. Well, we'll count her as, she's not, she, the, there's 26 in favour, the resolution has passed. Uh, Councillors, uh, the Public and Active Transport Committee, please. Councillor Murphy. Thanks, Chair. I uh, move that the report of the Public and Active Transport Committee meeting held on Tuesday the 11th of August 2020 be adopted. Second. It's been moved by Councillor Murphy, seconded by Councillor Landers. The report of the Public and Active Transport Committee meeting dated Tuesday the 11th of August 2020 be adopted. Is there any debate? Councillor Murphy. Thanks very much, Chair. Last week's committee presentation was on the Indrapilly River Walk. As we know, the Indrapilly River Walk is part of this administration's commitment to getting residents home quicker and safer by extending our bikeway travel network and providing improved travel options. This is, uh, make no mistake about it, a transformational project for the western suburbs, including those on the south side of the river. It provides a much anticipated safer alternative to the current corridor. Those who know the area well, and there are a few in this room, uh, will be aware that the current corridor along Radnor Street is very constricted with a number of conflict points. Um, the new river walk will create 790 metres of high quality, safe, connected, accessible pathway from Twig Street, extending all the way over the river, under the Jack Pesh Bridge to the Witten Barracks site. This project has been very enthusiastically welcomed by uh, local residents. The river walk will provide a connection to the Brisbane River Loop, Brisbane's most popular recreational and training ride. For many, many cyclists use that. It will eventually provide a connection to the Western Freeway Bikeway, a significant connection point and part of the primary cycle route, connecting the Western suburbs to the University of Queensland. UQ is Brisbane's second largest trip attractor with 38,000 students going there. Construction of the Indrapilly River Walk will involve 84 board piles, 184 precast concrete beams, and a way for the drum roll, 3,860 cubic metres of concrete and 850 tonnes of steel reinforcing. So a very significant uh, project here from an engineering perspective. 
Construction of the Riverwalk has boosted the local economy by providing 60 local jobs, sourcing precast bridge decks from uh, Bromelton and pile liners from Wacol, with most works planned to be undertaken from a locally sourced barge. Uh, and Councillor Mackay and I uh, were out there last week putt-putting uh, in our little tugboat around those barges, and uh, they were very impressive indeed, weren't they, Councillor Mackay? Historic plaques and viewing platforms will be included in the construction of the Riverwalk. Images of the Indrapilly Chelmer Ferry in 1906 and the Walter Taylor Bridge under construction in 1935 uh, were shown to the committee. In terms of usage, it's forecast that 1,600 cyclists and 600 pedestrians will use this new connection from day one. And of course, um, this will just increase as time goes on. And we know when we build these pieces of infrastructure um, that immediately that demand is taken up and they become more and more popular and we have to uh, go and build further connections to it. And this will uh, provide, as I said, a safe and accessible route uh, to the Jack Pesh Bridge, which under normal circumstances sees an average of 1,400 cyclists and 540 pedestrians uh, crossing every day, which uh, during COVID has actually seen a 20% increase in pedestrian numbers. So it's great to see uh, all the pedestrian and cycling traffic, which has gone up during COVID, one of the few things that has gone up. When we undertook a community survey uh, when first investigating the project, the local community raised a number of really positive pieces of feedback around how they, current have, they currently have to drive to the Indrapilly railway station because Coonan Street is a very busy road and very difficult to cross. Um, this provides an ability to have a nice walk to the railway station, a very positive outcome for the local community. One of the key pieces of feedback that we received um, was on the positive impact that this uh, will have on their journey, because currently a lot of those commuters need to drive to get to that train station. Uh, we'll also be connecting the Indrapilly roundabout upgrade, um, and we're hearing from the community about just how important that these two projects are together, complementing each other, working closely together. Um, so it's front of mind, of course, as uh, the Indrapilly roundabout project progresses. It's anticipated that works will be complete by late 2021, weather and construction uh, conditions permitting. The committee also considered a petition to extend the New Farm River Wall from its current landing point at the southern end of the Howard Smith Wharves, uh, past the development to link directly with the City Reach Boardwalk. Um, as I said uh, in the committee, Council currently has no plans to construct a new Riverwalk section joining the New Farm Riverwalk and the City Reach Boardwalk. The existing route through Howard Smith Wharves is listed as a primary cycle network on Council's bicycle network overlay and performs the function of the route with the shared pedestrian and cycle pathway provided uh, through the site. If a future Riverwalk structure was investigated, it would need to take into account the uh, presently proposed Howard Smith Wharves ferry terminal, other mooring points along Howard Smith Wharves and any impacts to uh, lessees over the Howard Smith Wharves site. The um, committee agreed with councillors uh, Councillors Cassidy and Shree abstaining. And I'll leave further debate to the chamber. Thank you, Chair. Further speakers? Councillor Johnston. Uh, yes, I rise to speak on the Indrapilly uh, Riverwalk just uh, briefly. Um, I just, uh, given there's an opportunity to speak to it again, um, uh, I just want to place on the record uh, my concern about the connectivity to the south side of uh, the river, and that's uh, to Chilmer. Um, whilst the plan following its revision to have stage one and stage two incorporated together did improve access by providing pathway uh, from the Jack Pesh Bridge connection through to the new river walk, um, we still have an extremely poor connection um, from the existing Walter Taylor Bridge around. And that's a very steep staircase uh, down um, down uh, beside the bridge to access the new uh, river walk off Radnor Street. That's just unacceptable uh, in my view. Otherwise, um, residents coming off the Walter Taylor Bridge have to continue to use the extremely narrow, as Councillor Murphy um, has outlined, the extremely narrow pathway uh, that uh, runs around until they get to the new uh, connection at um, Foxton Street, I think it is, where it will link down to the river. Um, it was really, I think, um, when this project was first put out, really not done in the right way um, to look at connectivity on the north-south alignment. Um, and 
to me, that was a, a major oversight. We still have a problem um, in my area getting to um, these bridges on the south side. Um, the extent of what bikeways pass for in my ward is usually a yellow bike which has been stenciled onto the bitumen. Um, there aren't uh, real bikeways uh, out my way, despite it being a very big cycling community. Um, currently, we have a staircase on Oxley Road um, just near Queenscroft Street. Um, and there is no safe bikeway access uh, to off-road bikeway access to the Jack Pesh Bridge coming along Oxley Road. And I've lobbied hard for that to be considered as part of the scope of this project, and unfortunately that's been rejected. Um, so again, um, the only option for my residents will be to ride on Oxley Road, um, which is a dangerous road and it shouldn't be the case. So there's a staircase on the footpath on Oxley Road, there's a staircase on the Walter Teller Bridge, and to me, Council have not looked at the connectivity uh, to this new infrastructure um, in an appropriate way. One of the suggestions I had um, you know, a couple of years ago was to look at whether or not um, you could cantilever the bridge off Radnor Street um, and uh, cantilever it around rather than, you know, um, building uh, a river walk. And I was told, no, no, we couldn't do that, councillor, because uh, we'd have to cut down the trees. Every single tree has been cut down yeah. on the northern banks of the river, and they're building the river walk in the river. I honestly am shocked by the damage that's been caused to the vegetation on the northern bank. I know, it was shocking. I mean, we couldn't possibly cantilever a solution because that would destroy the trees. Meanwhile, the bridge in the river that's not connected to the bank has destroyed the trees. So, you know, to me, I think um, clearly Council's not been prepared to look at um, all the options here. Um, it's unfortunate, again, that the north-south corridor is being neglected. Um, this needs to be a useful piece of infrastructure for residents on the south side as well as residents on the north side. And I encourage Council to look at the submissions that I have made to make sure that we can connect cycling uh, public, particularly students, because a phenomenal amount of kids go to school um, on the other side of the river. Indrapilly State High, the catchment is Chelmer and Graceville. Those kids are on foot or on bike, um, and we need safe um, connectivity for them, um, in addition to all the private schools that are on the north side of the river as well. Um, and I don't think it's reasonable that children should be forced with the only option to ride on the road. Um, we need safer off-road pathways, um, and I urge Council to take another look at the connecting section um, on Oxley Road uh, to the Jack Pesh Bridge so that we have an off-road solution all down the one side of the road um, so that we can get um, better north-south connectivity, um, not just uh, east-west connectivity in this project. Further speakers? Councillor Mackay. Thanks, Chair. I rise to speak on the Indrapilly Riverwalk. And you know, Chair, you hear some funny things in this chamber, but uh, we, it, one thing I, I did appreciate hearing was the story from Councillor Murphy about our, our little boat trip. It felt like we were going exploring up the Zambezi. We had our, our little hard hats on and our high vis, and it was like we were out spotting for things. We were spotting for stairs. We didn't see any stairs on this bikeway. Even though you hear that, don't you? You hear, there are stairs on a bikeway. Who, who would put stairs on a bikeway? There are no stairs on a bikeway, none. But you know what we did see, Chair? Lots and lots of trees, big old growth gums down near the, uh, the riverbank on Radnor Street, lots of trees. I don't know where the people think that all these trees were cut down. It's bizarre. There is a heritage-listed uh, boat ramp down there where the Indrapilly Ferry used to go, and there were some trees that had grown up over there. They were cleared, that's true, but they were, uh, they were just little trees that had grown over the existing boat ramp. So, yeah, I don't know what's going on there with uh, all these trees had been cut down. Bah, not true, Chair, that's not true. But you know what else we saw? We saw fantastic cycle connectivity from the south side all the way across the Jack Pesh Bridge, and we saw what's going to happen. And what's going to happen, Chair, is that the Jack Pesh Bridge is going to have a little turn off just near the Witten Barracks, and that's going to be where the Riverwalk joins up to the Jack Pesh Bridge 
and it goes underneath the Jack Press Bridge, the Albert Bridge, the other railway bridge, the Walter Taylor Bridge, and then down towards Ambrose Tracy. And Chair, my, uh, two of my nephews go to school down there and they're very excited about this because hundreds of kids can ride their bikes safely off Radnor Street, off the little narrow path that's currently there, and they'll be on what I call world-class infrastructure. This cycleway will change the way people get around that area, all the way from the western suburbs up in, uh, in Jamboree Ward, down the, down the Western Freeway. All the people from Chelmer, they, they're welcome to come onto the north side on this fantastic bicycle infrastructure. So I congratulate Council for doing this. I cannot wait until it's finished. I thank the bicycle user groups for supporting this project. They know there are no stairs, Chair, and they are very excited to see this world-class infrastructure come to life. All right, further speakers? Councillor Shree. Thanks, Chair. Just rise to speak on the um, petition regarding Howard Smith Wharves. The, there was a, a brief debate in the committee about this petition, and I took Councillor Murphy's point that it would be impractical to build a river walkout in front of Howard Smith Wharves, but I think that didn't address, really address the core concern of the petitioners, which is that Howard Smith Wharves is no longer particularly accessible or func functional as a cycling transport corridor, um, which was its one of the intended purposes of the revitalisation of that precinct and uh, was one of the aspects of the development that many cyclists were looking forward to. The, since the development's gone in, I've, I've personally been down there a couple of times and seen that the, the shared pathways are often quite heavily congested and often encroached upon by outdoor dining, informal or unauthorised loading uses, temporary storage of equipment or goods related to the, um, the various hotel and um, hospitality businesses down there, etc. And the core problem essentially is that this comes off directly off the New Farm bikeway. So for a cyclist, your experience is um, one of having a really fast, straight, easy ride along the river and then suddenly you find yourself in the middle of a bit of a schmozzle. And I'm concerned today to notice a new development application for Howard Smith Wharves, which appears to rem seek to amend some of the development approval conditions of the original approval and remove references to the importance of providing bike access through the precinct. So I know this has been a cause of some significant concern for not just local residents of Central Ward, but cyclists who commute through there. And I'm certainly not um, going to argue that this is the worst thing in the world, but I, I, I do think there's a gap here and the council hasn't done as good a job as it could have of ensuring good cyclist connectivity and, and safety through that precinct. There's a, a bit of a concern emerging of fast-moving e-scooters and commuter cyclists sharing narrow footpaths with pedestrians. And I think probably the council needs to do a little bit more work in this space of ensuring that we get the best possible design outcome around that precinct. I realise there's a, a balance to be struck between the precinct's role as a destination and obviously you don't want everyone rushing through there like it's a high-speed commuter corridor but I don't think the balance has been struck at the right point at the moment, and it does seem to be particularly difficult for um, cyclists to move through there without feeling like you're about to hit a pedestrian or um, a pedestrian moving through there and feeling like they're safe from fast-moving e-scooters. So I, I would just urge the council administration to take a closer look at that precinct and to engage seriously with those concerns and criticisms that cyclists are advocating, and in particular to look closely at these, uh, this um, development approval or this development application that's seeking to amend some approved conditions because I do worry that in an effort to address some of the concerns that Council is raising about the bike path not being compliant or accessible, the applicant is simply seeking to remove the description of it being a bike path in the first place. So it might be something to look at a little bit closer down the line um, and on the basis that I don't think the petition response addresses those 
petitioner's core concerns, I won't be supporting this particular petition response. But I, I do genuinely encourage the administration to look a, a bit more closely at this precinct because there's some good, there's, some, there's potential there, but it just hasn't quite been realised. Um, and in particular, the encroachment along the the foremost pathway right adjacent to the river has been particularly disappointing because I think initial designs and proposals for the precinct showed that pedestrians would be able to move freely along the very front of the Howard Smith Wharves area, um, but increasingly that space feels more like a privatised dining area and pedestrians don't feel comfortable moving through that area unless they're accessing the, the restaurant dining itself. So maybe there's a gap there as well where what, what should have been an open, publicly accessible footpath is starting to feel like restaurant space because of the encroachment of um, outdoor dining. And, and I think that ties together with these broader concerns about cycling and pedestrian connectivity and access. Further speakers? Further speakers? No. Councillor Murphy. Uh, thanks very much, Chair, and I thank all councillors uh, who contributed to the debate uh, here. Just very quickly, uh, in terms of Councillor Shree's uh, contribution, you'll note the uh, development application that's currently before uh, council or currently before council's uh, assessment uh, agency in uh, development assessment. Um, there are no changes proposed to the bikeway. Uh, uh, or the shared path, I should say, not, not the bikeway, uh, in that proposal. So no changes uh, there. Secondly, um, th there seems to be this uh, idea that's crept in somewhere along the line, and I, I don't know where exactly it crept in, and maybe, maybe it's uh, from our friends in the cycling community, um, that that is uh, essentially a bikeway uh, that is being used as a driveway, um, whereas the reality is that was always approved, envisaged right from the very start as a shared path. It's a shared zone. It means uh, cyclists, uh, uh, delivery vehicles, pedestrians all have to share that space. It's a shared speed. It's a, it's a, it's a shared space that is a low speed environment. Um, and I know, I know for a fact that that doesn't suit um, some people. It doesn't suit the way they like to travel. In our city, they're, they're high speed, cyclists, they want to just get from A to B as quickly as possible and a uh, shared path inconveniences them and, and potentially um, there are conflicts in shared paths where you have different users. We know that. Uh, we know that that happens in a lot of places around Brisbane. Um, but in terms of uh, as it relates to this petition, uh, we don't think that it's the smartest investment to spend a lot of ratepayers' money rebuilding that river walk out the front of Howard Smith Wharves. Um, Let's also just think back to uh, where this all started. Po point of order, Chair. Point of order, Councillor Shree. Sorry to interrupt. Will Councillor Murphy take a quick Councillor question? Councillor Murphy, will you take a question? Sure. Thanks. Please, um, Councillor Shree, please proceed. Thank you. Um, maybe Councillor Murphy might have to take this on notice. I, I realise it's a bit of a specific question, but um, in the development application we're discussing, the applicant refers to amending condition 42, which currently reads, provide a shared bike slash pedestrian path through the site and the applicant is seeking to remove the words bike slash pedestrian. <laughs> do, what, what do you understand that to mean? Maybe it's nothing. I'm, I'm genuinely curious. Well, Councillor Street, that's, that's not my understanding of the application. That said, I, uh, I try to do my job in public and active transport. I don't try and moonlight as the development and planning assessment chair. So, but I will confer with her on that. Now, um, uh, where was I? So we're talking about the Howard Smith Wharves DA. Let's not forget that before the Howard Smith Wharves was uh, developed and supported by this council, that entire area was closed off to the public. Nobody can use it. It was derelict. Uh, and then all of a sudden, when it's become a usable part of uh, the public firmament here in Brisbane, where people come, they love to go and use it, they love to take part of the facilities there, they like to commute through it, all of a sudden um, there's debate around its shared use. And I actually think that's a good thing. I don't think that's a bad thing, to have people talking uh, about how we use that space uh, where the reality is for decades it was locked up and people in this city were not able to use it. So, you know, that's just one of those um, land use planning challenges that we have uh, here. We've made a decision through the development assessment process as to how we see that shared path uh, being used. And um, that's just, that's something we'll always have to work through going forwards. We will continue to do that with this, uh, with this process before council right now. Now, in terms of um, uh, councillor Johnson's contribution, um, just very briefly, um, I, I, 
Except the comments that Councillor McLaughlin was making before about her uh, role in a public affairs area of an engineering company, not an engineering area of a public affairs company, and I think that comes to the fore here because um, we did consider a cantilever structure, but it was not supported. Uh, the engineering case was not there for a cantilevered structure. It didn't work. It just didn't stack up. So I think um, in, in that respect, that has been assessed. Uh, now, on the... Um, and again, I suppose this is where public affairs comes in, Councillor McLaughlin, and, it's, and I admit it's very very good uh, media management to say that we're putting steps on a bikeway, um, but these steps are almost a kilometre away from what, the project extent of the, of the Interpelli River Walk. So uh, I just view this as a budget bid like any other. Uh, Councillor Johnson's making a budget bid on this project. Fair enough, but let's uh, not let the media in the room uh, and the media listening in be deceived into thinking that uh, the, the, the steps there are an integral part of the Interpelli River Walk. They are not, uh, and that is a future budget bid request that will be assessed uh, as part of the normal process process of budget assessment that happens each and every year when the Lord Mayor hands down his budget. Thank you, Chair. I will now put the resolution. All those in favour say aye. aye. And those against say no. The ayes have it. No division is called. The uh, Infrastructure Committee report, please, Councillor McLaughlin. Thank you, Mr Chair. I move that the report of the Infrastructure Committee meeting held on Tuesday the 11th of August 2020 be adopted. Second. It's been moved by Councillor McLaughlin, seconded by Councillor Landers, that the report of the Infrastructure Committee meeting dated Tuesday the 11th of August 2020 be adopted. Is there any debate, Councillor McLaughlin? Thank you, Mr Chair. Uh, in the last uh, few committee presentations, we've been working through the, what might be called the back of house infrastructure that supports our road network. Um, and that indeed was the presentation last week, Mr Chair. It was uh, a presentation that, it, that covered the advanced data centres that run our traffic network uh, and specifically operate the, our traffic signals, the VMS, the tra our traffic closed circuit television. So um, this data, these data centres are called modular infrastructure points of delivery, uh, yet another great council acronym of MIPODs. Um, and uh, the, this was uh, previously traffic signal equipment that was housed in small buildings across the city that were called traffic huts, um, but they were not fit for purpose purpose anymore as the equipment's got more and more sophisticated and advanced. So uh, as a consequence of design work, uh, these the MyPods were born and they form the core of our uh, intelligent transport system network, provide, providing the data and tools for our Metropolitan Transport Management Centre and uh, also providing services back to the police service, TransLink and TMR. So they've been built to have uh, multiple power sources, so they remain operational even during failure or damage to the network, they're built above floodlines. Um, so this is good kit for the council uh, to make sure that our traffic system um, remains operational and uh, has the most sophisticated equipment to hand to, to um, manage that system. So my thanks to the manager, Transport Planning and Operations, for the presentation. Um, these aren't highly visible bits of infrastructure, but they're fundamental to the operation of our road network and uh, pleased to, to have them there and to present that, uh, that, to have that presentation to the committee last week. Uh, Mr Chair, there were also uh, two petitions through the committee last week, uh, a petition requesting uh, that local traffic only status be applied to uh, Norman Street in Woolwin and a request to implement local traffic management in Lunga Street, Carina. I'll uh, leave it at that point for any councillor debate. Further speakers? Councillor Griffiths. Yes, uh, thank you, Mr Chair. I, I would just request um, Seri Adam for voting for items B and C. Uh, Seri Adam for, for so Seri Adam together for yes. items B and C? Yep, yep. that would be fine. Please, please, please uh, and really, it's the, uh, these two petitions that are of concern to the opposition today, in particular, um, with both these petitions, is the actual um, lack of action that are arising from the petitions. So the first one relates to Norman Street, Woolawan, and here we have 22 local residents uh, in an area uh, that are requesting some traffic management on their particular street. Uh, and in particular, they're just uh, requesting a local traffic only sign. And um, surprisingly, they're concerned, or not, not surprisingly, they're concerned about safety and speed on the street. But unfortunately, this petition just contains no actions in relation to what can be done for these residents and the, the issue they have of speed and safety in their street. 
Um, there's no recommendation of SAM signs, and uh, disappointingly for residents, there's no outcome. Um, and we note that Councillor Hammond, their local uh, councillor, supports this recommendation. So we are concerned about this and concerned about a lack of outcome for these residents. Uh, and secondly, in relation to item C, uh, Laguna Street at Carina, um, and this also connects with Darcy, Eleanor and Hendron Street um, at Carina. 35 residents there have petitioned for better safety in their streets. Um, but unfortunately, this petition says it's not going to do anything. All it says is Councillor Atwood will actually go out and consult with residents to see whether Council should do something. So once again, Council in its petition is actually not doing anything for these residents. And these residents, one of the things they requested was a local traffic only sign. They requested that but they're not getting a local traffic only sign, even though they're saying safety and speed are a concern for them, because they're waiting for the councillor to do consultation to see with whether all the other residents would support a local traffic only sign and some local traffic management. Um, once again, we're concerned that it contains no direct action and really is a very disappointing result for these residents. And uh, that's why we can't support these petitions. Thank you. Further speakers? Councillor Hammond. Thank you, Mr Chair. I rise to speak on petition B. Um, and I'd like to remind the, the councillor over on the other side that local traffic, um, local traffic signs can't go into a street unless there's traffic management. He's been around for 17 years, I believe, so I believe that he would actually know that. Councillors, um, please. Also, um, in that particular street, it's typical because he actually doesn't know the street, hasn't visited the street, doesn't know anything about this. He's just looking at a petition. So I might remind the councillor that it was the ALP state government who put a sign up as part of Airport Link to direct people down that street. Because what happened when Airport Link, and that's when, I must say, Minister Hinchcliffe lost his seat because of the mismanagement of um, Airport Link at the time and had to be moved to a safe seat of Sandgate, um, he, that sign was put up with no consultation to the local residents. That, that, the reason why it was put up is because they restricted access. So it was the state Labor government who are forcing people or encouraging people to go down this local street. I will say that this street actually does have signage in it, despite what um, Councillor Griffiths has actually said. We are also painting an island. It's got a, quite a sharp bend as it comes up to the school there. Um, a sharp bend that we're painting an island there to keep people on the right side or encourage people on the right side of the road. The reason why this can't be um, a concrete uh, uh, island in there is because it's also a bus route and the buses wouldn't be able to get around that particular bend. I will continue meeting with the residents of Norman Avenue. I've adopted it from the chair. Um, I'll continue meeting with them. And as everybody in this chamber knows, and I know Councillor Griffiths knows this as well, traffic management, people either want it or they don't want it. But I have met with many residents with different viewpoints out on that street, and I will continue to do so. But in closing, um, this, there is some action happening on this particular street. I have asked council officers to review the sign that the state government put up with no consultation, because that seems to be the Labor style, no consultation. Um, I've asked them to review whether the sign can come down from that location. Um, and again, I'll continue working with my local residents. Further speakers? Councillor Johnston. Okay. Uh, yes, thank you, Mr Chairman. Um, look, just to rise to speak on item uh, B, just very briefly, um, uh, look, uh, I, I've listened to what's been said here, but as I read it, and I'm not sure what else is going on behind the scenes, the petitioners are requesting, and I quote, local traffic only signage in their street. 
Now, we've all got streets that don't have traffic calming but have the advisory local traffic signs only. There is absolutely no problem with Council deciding to put those up. Um, and I'm really surprised that a councillor who's been here for 12 years, like uh, Councillor Hammond, um, isn't aware that those signs can go up in streets without traffic calming. So I would just say that I think, and this is this. I just had a discussion with the head of TNO a couple of days ago about this. We need to be more responsive to our residents, where we can fix small local issues like this that give them confidence in their street that give uh, motorists and other drivers some advice about the nature of the street and what is ahead. Um, I'm also very, he, very concerned to hear that buses can't go round a bend without driving over. OK, no, 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 intersection, uh, no interjections, please. No interjections, please. <laughs> Councillor Johnston. <laughs> I'm also very concerned to hear that buses can't drive around um, a bend in a street um, without crossing over a small centre island. Um, that is very concerning to me, which would indicate there is a bit of a problem um, with, uh, with buses being able to negotiate the street, as Councillor Hammond outlined for us. Um, but most importantly, back to where I was, um, I just want to say I think we need to be more responsive to residents um, where there are simple fixes that can give them confidence, um, like putting in improved signage, we should be doing it. Further speakers? Councillor Atwood. Thank you, Chair. Um, I also rise to speak um, on item C, a petition for traffic calming in Lunga Street in Carina. Through you, Mr Chair, I welcome a Councillor Griffiths or any of the Labor councillors to pick up the phone and call me rather than trying to slander me here in the chamber today. Um, but as well through you, I think you also know that you don't install traffic calming without first chatting to the residents directly. Point of so order. yes, I have Point done of order, that. Councillor Griffiths. Um, claim to be misrepresented. Mr. Yep, noted. Councillor Atwood. Um, however, I have written to the local residents in Lunga Street um, last month to speak with them further about this issue. The results have been very notable. Almost 40% of residents have responded, with 73% who are eager uh, for, for it to proceed, and 32% are happy for traffic calming devices to be installed in front of their houses. Um, it has been terrific to speak with the majority of residents on this street, and I look forward to continuing to work with them and Council to champion this issue. Uh, Councillor Griffiths, your mess representation. Yes, um, I think Councillor Atwood said that I slandered her. I didn't. I just raised her. I, I, sorry, uh, Councillor Griffiths, I heard her say slam. Slam. Oh, slam. Well, slam. Oh, sorry. Uh, anyway, uh, excuse uh, I, me. I yeah. shouldn't have done that. I've, I've accepted your misrepresentation. Yeah, yeah. I, I, slam or slander didn't do. Further speakers? I see no further speakers. Councillor McLaughlin. Oh, thank you, Mr Chair. Look, uh, I'm disappointed but not surprised to hear Councillor Griffiths get up to try and play base, base politics on a couple of issues that are well away from the Marika Ward. I, I'll hazard a guess that he's never been near Norman Street in Wollowin or Lunga Street in, in Carina. Uh, so all he's, all he's seen is, uh, oh, here's my chance. Here's my chance to get to a couple of LNP councillors because these are things that they've asked for. Oh, yes, there he is, rubbing his hands together with glee. You know, he's playing politics. That's all he's good for, playing politics in this place. That's all he's good for. Then Councillor Johnson gets up and supports him. You know, puppet and puppet master. We know what's going on there. So, um, so look, Mr Chair, the, these are issues that come before us. And, and to be frank, I'm disappointed that Councillor... That all, right, all right. All right. Thanks, Councillors. Councillors, please, uh, please come back to the matter at hand. Point of um, order. Point of order. Just to you, uh, uh, claim to be misrepresented. Yeah, I'd yeah, like that with John, yeah, puppet, and puppet master. Please, come on. <laughs> All right. <laughs> no, no, councillors, please. Councillor McLaughlin, please, uh, please um, turn your microphone off. All right. Councillors, I'm not going to allow Councillor McLaughlin to proceed until there's silence. Councillor McLaughlin. Oh, well, that'll be interesting to see who claims credit for pulling the strings. Uh, <laughs> But, uh, look, Mr Chair, these are the sorts of issues that come before us all the time. It's important that they're taken... No, no, no interjections, please. Councillor McLaughlin. It's important that they're taken seriously, and that's why they go to... No, no, OK. 
councillors, please allow the speaker to be heard in silence. This, this report's uh, going to be very soon concluded and I'd like to get it done quickly. Councillor McLaughlin. Thank you, Mr Chair. That's why it's important that these are taken to officers of council who are registered engineers who can make the decisions about the things, whether or not things are viable or not, uh, rather than former spin doctors for engineering firms making a decision that they know what's best. These are the decisions that are made by registered engineers who can assess the road network and, and make a call on whether the things that residents are asking for are, are viable or valid or not. Uh, it doesn't mean that we can't continue to look at the things that they're asking for. Street that has a fair amount of traffic. There are issues that can be undertaken, as Councillor Hammond has said, to improve the safety. If there are vehicles crossing a centre line, there have been no accidents. There have been no accidents, but it does cause concern for the residents who observe that happening, and that's what they've asked for. But if a concrete, a piece of, a slab of concrete was put in the middle to, uh, while Councillor Johnson thinks that's amusing to think that uh, a bus might have to drive over the top of it, that's not terribly good either for that bit of infrastructure or for the uh, successful operation of the buses either. So, so again, an in, a decision made by engineers based on what's being requested. Uh, in terms of Lunga Street, Carina, again, uh, local councillor going out as a champion for her street, looking at what might be done and something that might be done in the future. It doesn't stop the, the issues being addressed, but you can't come into this place and say, because a councillor has asked for it or demanded it, that it can be immediately implemented. That's why in the Infrastructure Committee we've been taking councillors through the process of how you make these changes in the network. And Councillor Griffiths, I'm disappointed in you, having gone through this process, looking at the Manual of Uniform Traffic Control Devices and the process that has to be stepped through before you can make changes to the road network that are consistent with state government legislation, that you get up here and try and make a base political point for no end other than that. Uh, Councillor Griffiths, you had a misrepresentation. Yes, I just wanted to say there's no puppet or puppet master over here. Thank you. All right, I will now put item A. All those in support of item A, please say aye. Aye. Thank you. And those against, please say no. The ayes have it. On items B and C together, all those in favour, please say aye. Aye. And those against, please say no. No. The ayes have it. Division called by Councillor Griffiths and Councillor Cassidy. Please ring the bells. All right, councillors, all those in favour of items B and C, please say aye and raise your hand and hold it there. Aye. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thank you, please lower your hands. And those against, please say no and raise your hand and hold it there. Thank you, councillors. Please lower your hands. Clerks, please read the result when you're ready. Mr Chair, the uh, ayes have it. The voting being 17 in favour, five against and one abstention. The ayes have it on all three items. Councillors, the Environment, Parks and Sustainability Report, please. Mr Chair, I move that the report of the Environment, Parks and Sustainability Committee meeting held on Tuesday the 11th of August 2020 be adopted. Second. 
It's been moved by Councillor Cunningham, second by Councillor Landers. The report of the Environment, Parks and Sustainability Committee meeting dated Tuesday the 11th of August 2020 be adopted. Is there any debate? Councillor Cunningham. Yes, thanks, Mr Chair. So the presentation last week was on Wildlife Movement Solutions Program. As it's well known, roads pose a threat to our native wildlife, such as koalas, kangaroos and wallabies. So Council is continuing to invest in a range of wildlife movement solutions across our city and suburbs. The program includes ongoing investigation and testing of infrastructure to support fauna moving underneath or above roads. Helping koalas, kangaroos and other wildlife navigate across roads safely is a complex issue and Council has been trialling new ideas to alert drivers, including variable message, message signs. We've had a lot of positive feedback from residents on these signs after we used them last year during the koala breeding season. So for the first time, Council will now also use variable message signs in areas popular with kangaroos and wallabies. In addition to variable message signs, Council has a program of more permanent wildlife awareness monitor signs, or WAMs, which have been installed across numerous priority zones in our city and suburbs. WAMs are permanent LED signs that monitor speed and will change from graphics, the koala green face, to text, to alert motorists to slow down. I know that in my own ward, the signs on Boundary Road have proved to be very effective. As the committee heard, the Wildlife Movement Solution Program is constantly evolving and we will continue to work with tertiary institutions and environment groups to get the local knowledge and input we need on wildlife movements. Last Tuesday in committee, we also had three submissions for the expenditure from the Suburban Enhancement Funds. They were approval for the construction of a bespoke junior playground in Norman Buchan Park at Barden, approval for the installation of a playground at Dunvegan Street Park in Heathwood, and approval for the installation of a playground at Macquarie Way Park, Drewvale. I'll leave the rest to the Chamber. Further speakers? Councillor Johnston. Yes, uh, just very briefly on um, the wildlife variable message signs. Um, look, there's a couple of things I want to say. We've had um, for probably almost a year a bit of a campaign going uh, to deal with the wildlife deaths on Fairfield Road, particularly through Fairfield, which is where residents have been observing the wildlife kills. Um, and there's a couple of things that I would like to uh, just say, because um, there is a petition going to come to Council too. It's, it's largely asking for, um, uh, you know, an overhead bridge or an overhead rope. Um, it is mainly possums, but there are other uh, different types of wildlife uh, at risk when crossing very busy arterial roads. Um, but what I want to say uh, with respect to this um, in reading the report before me today, um, despite the fact that residents are requesting uh, support for wildlife um, safety measures in busy areas, um, we have... 14, I think there are, are of these WAM locations, um, only two of which are in non-LMP wards. And it really troubles me um, that the LMP are uh, investing in their own areas uh, to improve outcomes for native wildlife in our city, but they are not prepared to do so in the other parts of our city. Um, and in particular, I can say this because I have asked before petitioning um, to do some wildlife improvement works along uh, Fairfield Road. And because we were ignored by Council, I'm now uh, petitioning so we can have the matter debated and discussed here in Council. Um, um, so I, I certainly support Council doing more um, to protect wildlife. Underpasses and overpasses are certainly really useful ways to do that, whether it's ropes or bridges or ladders or whatever it might be. Um, variable message signs and other signage um, certainly can be useful in some places, uh, but I think there needs to be more of an investment right around the city, including in wards like Tennyson. Um, and uh, recently I did a file request to have a, have a look at how many um, possums were being killed uh, on Fairfield Road and I got a letter back from the CEO with the numbers, which are extraordinarily high, um, and I was told I could not release the information to the public because it was secret. Now that's how many possums get squashed on Fairfield Road. It's secret information that we are not allowed to discuss publicly. 
Yeah, that's how this administration rolls. So I just want to place on the record again, I appreciate that the LNP wards are getting wonderful advancements for their wildlife outcomes in certain areas. That investment is not being made um, right around the city, and it should be. And I just flag that when this petition comes up to council for debate, I'll be calling for more investment in my ward in Tennyson. Further speakers? Councillor Owen. Thank you, Mr Chair. I rise to speak in support of Dunvegan Street Park and the funding that's coming through to bring new park equipment into this rapidly developing area. The Heathwood Rise Estate, where Dunvegan Street sits, is one of our newer areas in our city, and certainly it is home to people from, who have come from many different places in the world, but also that they have chosen our local community to build new homes, to create a new family Point environment. Of order. Point of order to you, Councillor Johnston. Sorry, um, this item's about variable message signs. That's correct. Councillor Owen, your... Um, I'm speaking about Dunvegan Street Park that uh, Councillor Cunningham referenced, the funding for that. I'm not sure if I can... Uh, Is it in sorry. the report? I'm sorry, Councillor, I don't know if I can... Um, well, given that the chair referenced it, Mr. Chair, if, um, I, I don't if you think, I don't think that I don't think that stains. I apologise, Councillor Owen. Can I please ask you to make these comments in general business? I apologise for this, but if it's not that's, in the if it's not in the report, I can't. That's one of the rules we've had for some time. That's fine, Mr. Chair. I'll, um, I'll um, just say that I appreciate you. Councillor Cunningham referencing Dunvegan Street Park and the growth in the area. Thank you. Um, further speakers? Anyone, Councillor Cunningham? All right, I'll now, put, um, I'll now put the item. All those in favour say aye. aye. And those against say no. The ayes have it. Councillors, the City Standards and, city, uh, and Community Health and Safety Report, please. Thank you, Mr Chair. I move that the report of the City Standards Community Health and Safety Committee meeting held on Tuesday the 11th of August 2020 be adopted. Second. It's been moved by Councillor Mark, seconded by Councillor Landers. The report of the City Standards Community Health and Safety Committee meeting dated Tuesday the 11th of August 2020 be adopted. Is there any debate? Councillor Marks. Yeah, thank you, Mr Chair. Look, there was a committee presentation on the apprenticeship program update, which is a great um, program that Council holds. In fact, it's so good that we um, have actually trouble keeping our apprentices because they want to go on. They're so well trained, they tend to go to other companies to work, but um, it's certainly a fabulous program. And there's also two petitions here that I'm happy to leave to the Chamber for debate. Further speakers? Further speakers? Councillor Marks? I'll now put the report. All those in favour say aye. Aye. And those against say no. The ayes have it. Councillors, the Community Arts and Nighttime Economy Committee, please. Councillor Howard. Thank you, Mr Chair. Mr Chair, I move that the report of the meeting of the Community Arts and Nighttime Economy Committee held on the 11th of August be adopted. Second. It's been moved by Councillor Howard, seconded by Councillor Landers, that the report of the Community Arts and Nighttime Economy Committee meeting dated Tuesday the 11th of August 2020 be adopted. Is there any debate? Councillor Howard. Uh, thank you, Mr Chair. Just very briefly, we had a presentation from the Manager of Library Services about Council's library collection. Um, it's always wonderful to hear from the fantastic Sharan Harvey. So, uh, and of course, we are very proud to have here in Brisbane Australia's largest public library service. And as part of this, we have more than 1.38 million collection items and more than 8.5 million loads and downloads. So we are very also really proud that we have an inclusive collection with a range of items to suit everyone, whether it be large print books, audio books, inclusive features and inclusive technology such as dyslexia font, digital items, languages other than English, LGBTIQ plus collections and of course our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander collection. Um, it was a wonderful um, presentation and I really want to thank our wonderful library team for all their hard work and dedication to supporting our diverse and inclusive city, and I commend the report to the Chamber. Further speakers? Further speakers? Councillor Howard? I'll now put the report. All those in favour say aye. Aye. Those against, no. The ayes have it. The Finance and Administration and Small Business Committee, please. Councillor Allen. Thank you, Mr Chair. 
Mr Chair, I move that the report of the Finance, Administration and Small Business Committee meeting held on Tuesday the 11th of August 2020 be adopted. Second. It's been moved by Councillor Allen, seconded by Councillor Landers that the report of the Finance, Administration and Small Business Committee meeting dated Tuesday the 11th of August 2020 be adopted. Is there any debate? Is there any debate, Councillor Allen? Uh, yes, Mr Chair. Just briefly, we uh, had a presentation at last week's committee on ICT innovation and uh, what's happening uh, across Council. And there's a, a number of very interesting uh, projects that are, that are underway and uh, technology innovations that will uh, serve Council well uh, in, in years to come. And uh, most of it focuses uh, around, but not exclusively, on uh, efficiency. Um, a couple of the ones that I'd really like to hi highlight is the uh, robotic process automation, and uh, this involves the uh, automation of sort of time-consuming manual processes. Um, that's obviously uh, a, a positive thing in the context of improving efficiency and the accuracy of, uh, of inputs into our systems. We also are looking at uh, extended reality uh, technology to uh, better identify and plot um, key council assets such as trees. Um, this assists us in managing those assets and it also assists us in managing potential risk associated th with those assets in uh, events such as storms. Uh, we are also uh, quite actively involved in um, what's termed the Internet of Things and this helps us to uh, undertake tracking on a range of uh, council um, monitors, things like barbecues, water meters and uh, moisture content in uh, parks and playing fields. So uh, this is in, you know, instrumental in helping council uh, undertake their activities across the city. Um, last but not least, we uh, have a fair bit going on in arti artificial intelligence and uh, machine learning. Uh, one of the things that uh, was of um, interest was um, in the context of dog complaints, we get a, uh, uh, an audio recording of those dog complaints and obviously um, depending on the uh, amount of time that a dog barks in an hour determines whether um, council moves forward with some sort of action and obviously having an officer sitting there undertaking that activity or that analysis is time consuming and so we're looking at uh, mechanisms to, uh, to have that information done in an automated fashion. And we're also uh, collaborating with uh, extern external student groups and uh, a couple of the projects that they're working on include uh, uh, street naming to, to make that process a, a little bit more uh, efficient. Obviously we don't want to uh, name streets ideally in a suburb, but we'll give them the same name. So we're looking at uh, mechanisms to make that process a little bit easier and also to uh, analyse uh, the city's street tree cover. Um, we also had a regular report, the uh, Bank and Investment Report for May 2020, and I'll leave further debate to the Chamber. Further speakers? Further speakers? Councillor Allen? I'll now put the report. All those in favour say aye. Aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Councillors, are there any petitions? Councillor Cook? Yes, thank you. Um, I've got a petition to upgrade cycling facilities when resurfacing roads. Councillor Strunk. Yes, uh, Chair, I have a uh, petition from uh, residents um, requesting uh, some traffic uh, calming be installed in Columbus Street, Anala. Councillor Johnston. Yes, thank you. I have a petition from residents calling on Council to refuse uh, the development at 9 Francis Street, uh, Corinda. Councillor Davis. Uh, thank you, Chair. I have a petition requesting Council name a place in Stringybark Drive Park, Aspley, as Kerry Blenko Place. Councillor Huang. Uh, thank you, Mr Chair. I've got a petition regarding a road upgrade in Rochdale. Um, Councillor Mackay. Thanks, Chair. I have a petition requesting the allocation of council land to be used for the creation and riding of mountain bike features by the Fig Tree Pocket community. Any other petitions? May I please have a motion to accept them? Mr Chair, I move that the petitions as presented 
be received and referred to the committee concerned for consideration and report. Seconded. It's been moved by Councillor Landers, seconded by Councillor Cassidy, that the petitions as presented be received and referred to the committee concerned for consideration and report. All those in favour say aye. Aye. Those against, no. The ayes have it. Councillors, are there any matters of general business? We'll begin. Are there any statements required as a result of, the, of an Office of the Independent Assessor or Councillor Ethics Committee order? There being none, further general business, Councillor Hutton. And also, councillors, a reminder that this is Councillor Hutton's first speech in this place with people here. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Councillor Chair. Hutton. Look, I rise to speak very briefly um, on the recent opening of the River Hills Recreation Hub located at the end of Summoners Road at Newcomb Park. Um, although the official opening was a little underwhelming due to COVID restrictions, we were able to join the company with um, Centenary Rowing Club, Springfield Centenary Kayak Club and a few River Hills locals. These days, the hub is a hive of activity with daily kayaks and canoes gracing the river. Is that not working? Oh, sorry. 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 Do you want me to start again? No, uh, keep going. Quite a question. Um, these days, the, the, the recreation hub is a hive of activity with daily kayaks and canoes gracing the river and loads of locals getting out their fishing rods and trying their luck. I recently met with Simon Newcomb, who is a former Olympic rower and the founder of Centenary Rowing Club, whom was delighted to see the addition to the park named in his honour. It is infrastructure like this which makes a real difference in our community and I look forward to delivering more facilities including barbecues, shelters and seating so more residents can pack a picnic and enjoy this beautiful park. I want to thank our council officers for the incredible work they have done on this project and I look forward to engaging the wider community when restrictions are lifted and celebrating the local clubs, the Lakers, Lakers Dragon Boat Club, Springfield Centenary Kayak Club and the Centenary Boat Club. Thank you. Further speakers? <laughs> Councillor Cassidy. Uh, thanks very much, Chair. Um, I rise to speak on uh, three items tonight, um, VP Day, India Independence Day uh, and the Uluru Statement from the Heart. Um, last week uh, marked a few significant milestones uh, for our community. Uh, Saturday, August 15, was the uh, 74th Indian Independence Day uh, and the 75th anniversary of the victory in the Pacific. Indian Independence Day marking the end of British colonial rule after a long period of civil disobedience and non-violent resistance during the independence movement is a significant day for people of Indian descent around the world. The Deegan Ward, like Brisbane as a whole, is home to a large and growing uh, Indian uh, population, people whose parents or grandparents travelled here some time ago and those who are very recent arrivals. I'm very lucky to have both a Sikh Gurdwara and a Hindu temple in my ward. Uh, attending the Vasaki Festival or Diwali is as part of our calendar in my ward as Australia Day or Christmas events are. The Vasaki Festival, organised by the Punjabi Cultural Association, is growing uh, and reaching out to more of the community each and every year. A new partnership with St Patrick's College would have seen this year's festival held at Curlew Park uh, for the first time, but with COVID restrictions, this event uh, was cancelled. Uh, these events, I'm sure, will be back uh, next year, and I know the 75th anniversary of Indian independence will be a great celebration uh, in 2021. Saturday, 15th of August, also marked the 75th anniversary of the end uh, of fighting in the Pacific and the swift end of the Second World War thereafter. What would have been a significant event for us uh, in the community to gather for COVID once again changed this for us. So uh, we were again encouraged to mark this event in our own ways. The war in the Pacific was the greatest test for Australia and changed our nation indelibly. If Gallipoli was viewed as the birth of nationhood, the war and victory in the Pacific cemented Australia's place in the world. Prime Minister John Curtin had been in office for just eight weeks when Japan launched its war in the Pacific. His government's determination not only to be heard in London and Washington but to forge a more independent foreign policy uh, is a remarkable legacy. 
Uh, his legacy for planning a better post-war Australia, including migration, full employment and social security, are uh, as important in our nation's story as his leadership during the war. He died six weeks before the Japanese surrender in August 1945. He was not alone, of course, 17,000 Australians dying while fighting in the Pacific and another 8,000 in Japanese captivity. The battle in the Pacific was as much about ideals as it was in Europe against Nazism. The freedoms that we take for granted today is something that many thousands of men and women laid down their lives for and we should be eternally grateful for uh, and defend that legacy with everything we've got. Many of us have family who fought. My grandfathers, Fred Cassidy and Stan Cheeseman, both served in the Air Force in the Pacific. Both survived and made a life for themselves when they got back here. I'm often amazed to think how the collective contributions of ordinary blokes like Fred and Stan resulted in the comprehensive defeat of tyranny right on our doorstep. For a nation on August 15, 1945, the war ended. For the families of those men and women who never came home, that war never ended. Today is also Veterans Day, Vietnam Veterans Day, where we commemorate the service of those who served in Vietnam. The Battle of Long Tan saw some incredible bravery uh, and that Australian spirit forged under the pressure of conflict over many decades. And this week, more than many others, Deputy Chair, we say, lest we forget. And finally, on Sunday, another significant milestone for our nation was marked with 45 years since the Wave Hill handback to the Gurunji people by the Whitlam government. In the words of uh, Prime Minister Gough Whitlam at the time, he said, I want to promise you this act of restitution which we perform today will not stand alone. I want to promise that through their government, the people of Australia will help you in your plans to use this land fruitful, fruitfully for the Gurunji. He went on to say, I want to acknowledge that we Australians still have much to do. And that couldn't be more true today than it was in 1975, all around our nation. There is much work to be done and we can contribute to that as a council. Just over a year ago, this council passed a motion supporting the Uluru Statement from the heart. It's call for truth-telling, a voice to government and constitutional recognition for our First Nations people. But that cannot be the end of the road for our support. The kind of national movement that is required to affect the change, a broad coalition needs active partners, not a council that is happy to support a historic motion here in this chamber and lend its significant weight to that cause through that action, raise hope and then people watch that hope fade away over the next year by a council doing nothing. I don't mean council hasn't done much, I mean council has done nothing. You cannot even find a mention of it on council's website. That would be a very simple act. Council developed an Indigenous aspiration strategy in 2004. The implementation phase was 2005 to 7, and the evaluation phase was 2007 to 2008. It also says in reviewing the IAS in 2018, the information gained from a community consultation session would be used to develop a reconciliation action plan in 2020. That reflects current Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander community needs, issues, priorities and aspirations. It has been 12 years since the IAS was evaluated and now two years since the review calling for a reconciliation action plan. What has happened? It's time for Council to stop dragging its feet and start being a genuine partner for Aboriginal people. This is an issue of national significance. We are the largest local government in Australia. We must do more. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Cassidy. Further general business? Councillor Owen. Thank you, Mr Chair. I rise to speak on a number of items tonight, Vietnam Veterans Day, International Days of Significance, my local community and, if time permits, Dunvegan Street Park. Firstly, as patron of the National Servicemen's Association of Queensland today, on Vietnam Veterans Day, I acknowledge not only the service of almost 60,000 Australians who served and particularly the 521 who lost their lives and the 3,000 who were injured, but specifically the 218 Nashos who paid the ultimate sacrifice. For many, there is still a contention around the Vietnam War, but unequivocally, 
the service of any person who fulfils a role in protecting our freedom and democracy for our nation deserves respect. Many returned servicemen face not only the horrors of war, but also a hostile reception when they returned home. I, for one, will place on the record today a heartfelt thank you to all of them for their service. The past weekend has seen also the recognition of Indonesian Independence Day, India Independence Day and Pakistan Independence Day. To everyone who lives in Brisbane and has a connection to these countries, I trust that you will have duly celebrated these important occasions in your calendar, although this year it would have been through a virtual celebration. It's amazing what technology can do and how it can bring people together at times like these. In regards to my local community, I must say they are amazing. In recent weeks in our local community, we have been at the epicentre of the COVID-19 cluster and also a second border breach between the suburbs of Acacia Ridge, Logan, Park Ridge and Springfield, Callumvale Ward is the epicentre of everything that has gone on in past weeks. We have connections between many schools, multicultural community groups, sporting clubs and shopping centres. And I am so proud of how our community came together to help keep each other safe. The demonstration in our local community on a wide scale has certainly reignited a sense of connection, a sense of responsibility and a spirit of cooperation. The patience showed by many residents while we all lined up together to be tested for COVID-19 was absolutely commendable. Even though we were standing out there on a cold Saturday morning um, in the brisk August winds, everyone was doing it to make sure we work together as a community. I know as a community, we have come together to have a united voice about ensuring that we are not jeopardising the safety of others. When I come into this place, I speak on behalf of my community. No other councillor should take the liberty to claim to speak on my behalf or on behalf of my community. I do not believe that as individual councillors we should dare to presume to know what is specifically supported or opposed in another area or to try to push a particular point of view. My community has been confronted recently by a very dire situation which could have been significantly worse. We do, however, all need to focus on keeping the people right across our city safe. I know many people who have been hurt by being denied time with loved ones in nursing homes and the distress it has caused not being able to visit or being able to attend a funeral. I have seen firsthand how palliative care units and hospices have been impacted with restrictions on family members and in my case as a friend when their loved ones have been at the end of their life. The, the hurt that has been felt by those people not being able to be there together to comfort one another is extreme. And yet there still seems to be by some in the community a level of selfishness and in some cases a lack of gratitude. I would like to thank each and every essential worker who lives or works in our local community and across our city, along with all the emergency services and healthcare personnel and support workers for the work that they have done and continue to do. To each and every person who has been a part of the COVID-19 testing process, I acknowledge the work, the very important work that you have been part of and thank you all for your efforts. I would like to read into the record a message from a frontline worker to reinforce the reality of what is being faced. And it reads, 
I am a nurse doing COVID screening and I am appalled at the level of abuse day in and day out that we are receiving from the public. We are trying desperately hard, Councillor Owen, to keep people who are vulnerable safe, yet still people are under a false sense of belief that they are somewhat immune to catching COVID-19. What one would see as simple tasks like social distancing or hand hygiene is a very difficult task to have people complete. Instead, we receive an onslaught of verbal abuse, including vulgar language. There are rules to enter all establishment now, not just hospitals. These rules are to keep people safe. There are changes to visiting hours and also changes to how many visitors people can have in a day. I am bringing this to your attention in the hopes that you may be able to write a post to our com local community to not just respect fellow nurses like me, but also doctors and to make people aware these changes as well. What is happening is not right, and we are just trying to keep Queensland safe so we don't have an outbreak like Victoria. Thank you for your help. Stay, so, stay well and safe. And I think that's a very important message because it comes from somebody in the front line, and it certainly does have an impact. And I have done a post on my, my Facebook page, but I feel it is important to share it in this important place as well, being the council chamber. Mr Deputy Chair, the last thing I would like to reflect on is the expenditure from the Suburban Enhancement Fund approval for the installation of a playground at um, Macquarie Way um, Park, Druvale, and also Dunvegan Street Park at Heathwood, which are both in the minutes of the Environment, Parks and Sustainability Committee report. Um, these are very important park projects for our local community. They are developing areas and certainly there is a need to make sure that the provision of play equipment for our young families living in our local community are attended to. It is a great benefit that we do have the opportunity as councillors to provide such funding through the Suburban Enhancement Fund to ensure that these needs are met. Thank you, Mr Deputy Chair. Thank you, Councillor Owen. Further general business, Councillor Johnson. Yes, thank you. Just briefly, um, there's a couple of things I want to mention. Uh, VP Day, um, Vietnam Veterans Day and being back in the Council Chamber. Uh, firstly, um, just an invitation to all councillors, if you are looking for something to do on VP Day, we do hold an excellent um, ceremony. Um, it's technically my RSL, the um, Annalee Stevens RSL. Uh, but the event is actually held in Councillor Griffiths Ward uh, at Stimson Park at Maruka. Um, and we had a wonderful event on Friday uh, where we commemorated the end of uh, the war in the Pacific. Uh, and it's an event that um, the Anne Lee Stevens RSL is very proud to hold each year. We still do have some uh, World War II veterans in that um, RSL. And I just want to thank them for, even in these really difficult times, finding a way to hold the ceremony. It was all beautifully, beautifully socially distanced. And uh, the president of the RSL made sure everybody was fit and well and we all signed in and it, it went very well. Unfortunately, there was no drinks afterwards at the RSL. So that was a bit disappointing. Um, but I just want to say a big thank you to um, uh, the Stevens RSL for all of their wonderful hard work uh, in commemorating VP Day. Uh, yeah, just briefly, certainly to all the Vietnam uh, veterans out there, it's always good to um, acknowledge them, of which my dad is one. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's been a hard week for or two for him, so I'm really pleased uh, that uh, he's on the mend. Um, I'd also just like to say, having been to Long Tan, it is quite a remarkable place, and it's not an easy place to get to. You need special permissions from the government. Um, but I was really lucky to go um, as part of an Australian political exchange delegation uh, to Vietnam. Oh, God. 
20 years ago, <laughs> 20, 20 years ago, um, and we were able to pay our respects on behalf of the Australian government um, uh, at uh, the memorial at Long Tan. Um, and finally, just on being back in the chamber, this is something that I've advocated for for um, some period of time, um, and I'm very pleased that we are back. I just want to thank um, all the council officers who have facilitated the IT changes um, and the arrangements that have been necessary to logistically get the council working. Um, I know that they put a lot of effort into it, and we originally were going to start back two weeks ago, um, and then obviously there was the, uh, the scare, and um, I'm glad we're back on track uh, this week. Um, it has been disappointing to see parliaments being cancelled in other states and in our federal um, federal sphere uh, because, uh, you know, we are a parliamentary democracy. I know, for example, Councillor Shree would like more of a representative uh, or direct action democracy, perhaps. I, I won't I don't mean to misrepresent what he would like. So, <laughs> so yep. Uh, but um, but uh, you know, um, our system of government is only as strong as the ability to meet, debate the issues of the day. And I think it's important that we are back in this place uh, and functioning again as a council. Um, but finally, I'd just like to say to all the LNP councillors out there, I know you must have missed me. It was so here. It was so nice to hear you all talking about me so much today. Um, um, and uh, I'm just delighted because every time, um, every time you mention me or you attack me, I get these wonderful emails from my constituents who are watching, who are listening, um, and, and they're like, why would they do that? And I'm like, well, my mere presence offends them some days. So I just want to say I missed you too. Feel free to keep talking about me as much as you would like. Um, I don't think anybody believes a word that you say about me and uh, every time you personally attack me, it reflects poorly on you, not me. Further general business. Councillor Atwood. <clears throat> Thank you, Deputy Chair. Oh, is it on? Yep. Tonight I'd like to speak about Lillian's Place, home of Beyond DV. Uh, last week, the Lord Mayor, Lady Mayoress, Councillor Cunningham, Councillor Cook and myself and a number of other dignitaries had the absolute pleasure of attending the official opening of Lillian's Place. Beside the delicious treats handcrafted by the women, a highlight was hearing about the number of women who have already used this facility. Last week alone, over 200 women visited the centre to participate in different courses, such as goal setting, certificate three, fitness courses, uh, meeting with local lawyers, schools, finance planners, to try to help them get back on track. After visiting the centre a number of times to volunteer in different capacities to get it up and running, I've made quite a close friendships with a number of the women in there, and to see them grow in such a short time has been really heartwarming and very rewarding. There is nothing like Lillian's Place in other parts of our city, and I truly believe it is critical that we do everything we can to help Beyond DV grow their services so more ladies right across our city can get involved in their programs, increase their skill sets, and grow their social networks to try and ensure they don't go back to their past relationships. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Abwood. Is there any further general business? Councillors, uh, there's been a lot of people who've done a lot of hard work behind the scenes here to get us back in the chamber. Can I please ask for your appreciation to be shown in the chamber? Uh, with that, I declare the meeting closed. Thank you.